Um, I make lots of mistakes. I'll start with that. Um, so with no-till, we started out cover cropping um, 20 years ago because of mandates by our government. So we would plant the cover crops and then kill them as early as we could so that the field was, was brown when we would plant it because we thought that was right. So part of our ground we would till, we would disc and plow, and part of it we would no-till into brown uh, stubble, whether it was corn stubble or soybean stubble. Uh, the issue was if the ground doesn't have anything growing on it, if it's just brown and dead, underneath the soil, the soil stays wet and it stays cold. So it's very difficult to plant into in the spring because it stays damper and colder longer. So that was our biggest mistake. And in addition, the, the ground where it's bare is a different climate than where it has cover. Um, so that's kind of what I would persuade people not to do in no-till. It's the easiest way to no-till because it doesn't require a whole lot of equipment setting. You set your planter the same as if it's plowed. Essentially, you just put a little more pressure on it. Um, but if it's green, it, uh, it makes a plant much better. But you need special attachments on your planter. Um, how many folks were here this morning for Christian? Was, did anyone watch Christian Abade this morning? No. Okay, so a couple. Okay, he may know more than me. <laughs> no. So, um, let me see if I can click to this. We'll go here. So I'll start... I was going to try and hear more with the So this is kind of the yields. I'd say they're probably similar to France. I think I translated them correctly. Um, so we're growing the same yields as my conventional peers. Uh, and I think this can be done. We're still using high inputs. We're still using uh, fertilizers and pesticides. Uh, but we're planting it all green, which I think, uh, for me, is the first step in ecological agriculture, right? You know, our goal now is to bring down the amount of fertilizer we use and the amount of chemicals. And rather than go straight into organic, I'm trying to build a system over time. So this is a system that's been started 20 years ago and then started planting green 15 years ago to where now everything is planted green. We're slowly bringing down our chemical use and slowly bringing down our fertilizer use. And that way we're not risking financial things, right? You know, I can still grow these crops, and I'm more green than I was, but probably not as green as I should be. Um, a few things we've learned. Um, I was going to kind of start with planting the equipment and then go through the whole planting cycle, including technology and how we do things. Um, if anybody has any questions along the way, I'd like to make it a discussion because it won't last three hours if we don't have a discussion. <laughs> So this is how I started into no-till. When we harvest wheat, we spread the straw, we don't bale it, we never have because of the amount of potash that it takes off the field, the amount of fertilizer that is removed with the straw where I live was not economical. Um, so even in my father's generation, up through my generation, we spread the straw in the field and we're far enough south, I don't know what the climate similarity is to France, but we're far enough south that we can sow soybeans directly behind the wheat. So we learned how to no-till. We've been doing this for 30 years where we, we, we cut our wheat, plant the soybeans. A very difficult environment to no-till into because of the amount of straw. The combines today grind the straw much better than they used to, but before when you had long straw coming out the back of a combine, um, very difficult to plant into. So we learned how to no-till in tough environments through this. Uh, our environment, is considered very similar to the European wheat environment. Um, Case, Interna or Case New Holland, the, 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 the equipment companies actually come, when they don't want to send a combine to experiment with to Europe, they come to my farm because it is the most similar in the United States to England and France in terms of growing conditions. In other words, we have high humidity, uh, large amounts of straw, you know, in terms of biomass. Uh, so the combines, the grinding, the chopping mechanisms, the planting, uh, a lot of times if they're close to me, they'll come to my farm to get something that's similar to what you guys have here because typically your wheat is the most demanding in the world in terms of people wanting to grind their straw and get it chopped up because you have the highest yielding wheat in the world. Uh, we try to copy your growing techniques of wheat um, and we've done so somewhat. I'm still probably not quite at the yields they're achieving here, 
but the equipment is very comparable. Um, so this is where we learned to plant. And we've since, um, our planters are a little, set up a little different. Um, so this is our John Deere corn planter. So does everyone want to get a little technical into the equipment? Do I have farmers here? Okay. Uh, the question was how high do we cut the wheat? Um, we used uh, Shelburne Reynolds heads for uh, probably 10 years that just stripped the, the, the heads off. It's a British company. Um, since we got to the, the draper headers, we w got away from the uh, stripper heads. Uh, we're running drapers that are made by Macdon, and we're cutting as high as we can. So typically about that high. Unless the wheat lodges, then of course we go down and we, we get it off the ground. But we cut it uh, typically about that high to ensure that the wheel tracks from the combine don't have a mat of straw. So the less straw we spread, the better. So we'll plant the soybeans, harvest the soybeans, then we'll cover crop, and then we'll plant corn no-till into that the following year. So we're planting through a thatch of straw and bean stubble that really covers the ground. And we've been doing that forever, but the cover crops are what's been added into it. Um, I'd say that the biggest difference you're going to see between me and the, the pictures that you've seen of the Europeans that have showed pictures at the presentations um, is we use row cleaners. I like the row to be clean. So this is, it's, does everyone know what a planter unit is? Everyone knows what they're looking at here. This is a John Deere uh, corn planter. This is the unit. It's not folded up. So these row cleaners go in front of the row and clean it. Um, I don't like to plant into green without row cleaners because as the gauge wheels go over top of the greenery, if there's any difference in depth of the greenness, the depth of the seed goes up and down as well. Um, now, I'm not saying that what I'm doing is right because a lot of the other farmers aren't using these. Yes? Uh, to clean the road, this is just, all I'm talking about now is strictly the, the planting. Uh, so there's no chemicals uh, prior to us planting. So this wheel spins, there's two of them, and they intertwine, and they take any of the, the, the residue that's on the ground, and they wipe it away. So you get about a band about this wide, that's essentially bare dirt. So as the planter is going along, these wheels aren't running over the green. It's the same as in no-till. If you no-till and you go through corn stalks, every time these gauge wheels go over a stubble, they bounce up, the seed comes up. So this is only going to give you the depth control of what's on top of the ground. Um, so we've we found that by having this in front, um, we learned this when we were no-tilling brown, uh, that with those things moving the, the, the residue out of the way, it cleans it, and that gives us a very monolithic planting bed. It gives us almost like a conventional style bed in terms of depth. With corn in particular, every seed has to be exactly the same depth, or you get uneven emergence, which affects yield. Um, so that's why we've, we concentrate on that. Um, the problem with the covers is if the covers are, if you have a, a thatch of cereal rye and you mash it over, it might be that deep, right? You can imagine cereal rye this tall getting pushed over is going to be that deep on the ground. So this wheel will come off the ground that far. Um, we also do all of our covers while they're standing. Um, I'll get into the rolling and crimping, but I don't like to go into fields that have been rolled which is also the opposite of what you've been heard. So that only shows that there's many different ways to do it. Um, so this is where we put fertilizer down. Uh, so what we found, particularly in corn, uh, the main reason we started using cover crops was to remove all the nitrogen and phosphorus from the soil in the winter so that it wouldn't go into the groundwater and the rivers. It was completely environmental. It had nothing to do with philosophy of farming, nothing else. It was, we had pollution coming off our fields going into the groundwater, going into the river. So we planted cover crops to, to stop that. Um, the, the problem we ran into was once we removed all the nitrogen and phosphorus and we went to plant corn, there was no nitrogen or phosphorus in the ground that we were used to, right? So we had a problem. We had to adjust the way we were fertilizing. We weren't running this. So this goes uh, six centimeters beside the seed trench and we're putting down about 30 pounds of nitrogen and about 40 pounds of phosphorus right here. So as that seedling 
germinates and the initial roots come off, they can go right there and have that fertilizer readily available because the soil is no longer mineralizing for us because it's all tied up in the cover crops. What's in the cover crops we'll get back later, but those small seedlings definitely need phosphorus and nitrogen in order to thrive, right? They need to come up green. You don't want yellowing. You don't want it under any strain while that corn plant's small. So that's one thing that we learned um, that's quite significant. And then we'll get into carbon and nitrogen tie up in a little bit. Um, but that's where it gets, that's where I've really had some challenges and really cost myself some yields is in growing the big covers and getting the nitrogen tied up for way too long. Uh, the question is, do I have any permanent cover crops? As of right now, I do not. Um, I don't know how complementary crops work in a cropping system. Uh, the only thing that we do that, uh, no, we, we, we clean, we spray, and we kill everything except for the crop that we're growing. So we're growing a single crop at a time, uh, corn, soybeans, or wheat. Uh, the only mixing that we do is we do put uh, radish in our wheat that we seed in the fall, and that gives us a little bit of diversity. Uh, but we're not doing anything with permanent covers. Um, no, it's all seeded annually uh, after harvest. Um, so I'll get to it, to uh, the mixtures in a bit, but we started with just cereal. Um, we started with just barley, uh, was our first ever cover crop. That's probably the most forgiving. Um, if I was looking to give someone a recommendation, it would be just seed some barley and plant into it in the spring. Um, but this is an example of crimson clover, uh, vetch, uh, cereal rye. Uh, there's some spring peas in there. So we're usually doing a five or six way mix uh, just to build diversity. We, we're definitely loading up the legumes where we're going to plant corn so that we, have, so we can avoid the nitrogen issues. Um, so this apparatus here, this is what closes the trench. Um, this one's made by Yetter. I like these. I run different closing systems on all my planters. Closing the trench is very difficult and can be quite challenging in no-till and in particular planting green. Um, when the soil, uh, when you cut it in half and you cut all the roots in half, the soil doesn't come back together and met weld like it would normally. Because you're cutting the roots, the soil has the consistency of, of chocolate cake, right? It's like a nice moist cake or like a nice bread. So when you slice through it, it's very difficult to stitch back together. So the conventional methods of closing the trench um, don't work as well. Plus, we don't want to compact it too much, so we don't want to squish it. Uh, so I'm using these currently, so they come down and squish it almost like a conventional closing wheel. But we got away from some of the spikes. Um, and then this wheel comes and goes across it. But if you look at my uh, Kinsey planter, we run two different brands, or we run three different brands of planters. It's the same closing wheels, same fertilizers, same this, but back here we run a spike and a cast wheel. So that gives us a little more pressure on one side than the other, but still breaks up the sidewall with the spike. Uh, we ran two spikes for a while. The problem with, if you run, sorry if I'm losing people, this is the spike here. If you run those side by side, they aerate the soil very nicely, right? So you get a good, the problem is they sometimes aerate it too much. If the soil gets soft, they go in too deep and then you can pluck the seeds out. Um, so we went to this and this. So this year, I don't have a picture of it because we didn't get them in yet. We're gonna run the spike and then it's gonna have one of these banded wheels next to it so that we can have depth control on the closing wheel system. So the closing wheel system will look identical to the row cleaners. Yes, the back wheels are, we're trying to, to, to not just squish it together, but work it and leave it soft while at the same time getting it closed. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge. In conventional, you know, if the ground's plowed, you would just squish it together and, and go on. With this, it's a little more uh, technical to get the trench closed. Um, there's lots of different brands of this. Uh, these are kind of the two that we've decided on, but uh, conventional cast wheels don't work very well uh, in planting green. You need to get some aeration to the soil, whether it's a small spike or an aggressive spike um, like you see here. So, and then up here we have the fertilizer. Here you can see we have um, an air cylinder on these row cleaners. So as the, as the cover crop changes in density, as you get into thinner and bigger and smaller crops, it's nice we have an in-cab control 
where we can raise these up or down. You don't want to create a trench, you just want to barely wipe the soil clean of residue because if you create a trench, you run into the erosion problems that we saw in all the pictures here. So if you go up a hill and you've worked the ground with these too aggressively, then when it rains, it exposes that trench, the water will channel down through it. So it's, a, it's, it's fairly delicate, it takes a decent amount of pressure, but as you go through the field, once you set it in a field, it's usually set for the whole field, but you want to be able to adjust it so that if you get into something this tall, it doesn't require near the pressure of something this tall. Um, they make these for all size planters. My planters are, are fairly large, but they're adaptable to any size. Uh, we buy them by the row. Originally, we had ones that we would have to get out of the tractor and go adjust. Now we have a cylinder here that's run, from an run on air, like a shock absorber on a truck. And in the cab of the tractor, you can determine the amount of pressure. You can either put up pressure on it if it's got too much weight, or you can apply down pressure if you need more aggressive cleaning of that row. We get out and look every field. Um, we dig behind the planters every field and check every field because that's really the only way. It takes a lot more time to plant no-till than it does conventional. Our ground speed is much slower and we look behind the planter a lot more than we did because um, you have to because the field conditions change uh, much more than they would if everything's consistent. It takes time and you really have to think about it. It, it requires um, more th a better, a more of a thought process when you set your planter than planting into a plowed field. It's not bad, but you just have to get out and look at it and the seed, when it's in the ground, the way I think about it is it should have the exact same environment that it would in a conventional field. So I'm trying to create that environment because you don't want, you want even depth, you want seed to soil contact, so your fundamentals of farming stay the same no matter who the farmer is, whether you're organic, whether you're conventional, whether you use chemicals or not, the fundamentals of seed placement, planting seeds, whether it's vegetables, row crops, anything, are always the same. So the question is how do we mechanically create that in an environment that has stuff growing in it that's unusual? It's possible, but you have to make sure that you're equipped for it. Like I said, the row cleaners, I don't know if they're necessary. If you, have a, if you have a drill, it's entirely different. Drills that don't have gauge wheels, you probably don't need the row cleaners as much. Um, but if you're using a planter that has the wheel beside the coulter, then you need it because the, the, it's, it's riding over it. Um, we use these. These are uh, seed firmers. So as the seed goes through the ground, it puts a little bit of pressure on the seed, makes sure that there's no air gap below the seed. Like I said, that's a very just a fundamental farming thing that uh, would be the same under any circumstances. So here's our case planter. Um, does anyone wonder why I have three different brands of planters? Sure. <laughs> um, the answer is yes. Um, because uh, each of the guys that works for me likes a different brand, so we get what they like to run. and. Um, it keeps everyone happy, right? That keeps me happy. <laughs> so this one's built a little differently. So this is, is more of a close-up of the row cleaner. So to your question, if you're wondering what it was, this is, this is the close-up of the teeth. This one's a little different. The other one's had spike teeth. The spike teeth don't work as well if you have corn stalks because they'll, they'll, they'll poke a corn stalk and get stuck and hung up. These are curved, and that part right there is actually sharp, uh, so it's more of a cutting action. The problem was that the ones they came out with a couple years ago didn't intertwine, so they weren't aggressive enough. You couldn't put enough pressure on them to get, they were great for no-till that was brown, but they did not work well green. You couldn't get them to move enough stuff. They wouldn't move enough residue. These are built by Martin, and they are much more aggressive. The other thing I like about these is the other ones, um, If you look at these, they have a single point for a hinge. So by having that single point hinge, every time it hits something, it's, it's hitting hard here. So the, this unit gets some interference from that. So it, it's, it's a good system, but this one, you'll see has parallel links. So it's two links running like this. So as it hits things, it floats more. It's more like a planter unit. 
Um, so this is what we're moving to. They're, very, they're expensive, so we're moving slowly. Um, so we just got them for this planter. Uh, we used them last year, and it's still got the air cylinder here, and then the two uh, wheels that are intertwined. Um, so that's kind of what our planters uh, look like. Um, the question was, is the operator still in control of this? And yes, even though we've added the technology, we've now put more responsibility on the planter operator. Um, the guy running the planter needs to be more knowledgeable in a no-till system than before. If it's a farmer running the planter, then it's no problem, right? I don't know how many folks have other folks that run their planters, but you have to really pay attention to all of it um, in no-till. It's, it, it's a lot different. Um, like I said, this works really well. Um, it's, on a, it's on our case planner, but um, uh, this is one thing we started this year. So this is the, the disc opener. Um, I really like these for wheat straw. Um, they're just starting to make them, but this is the, the opener. This is this blade. So any of you that have planted uh, behind wheat, one problem you have is you go through and you clean the row, and then your disc openers go through the row and form the trench. If there's anything laying in the way, a lot of times if you have straw or something with a lot of lignin that's very tough, it squishes down in the trench, and then you get it pinched in there, and it's not good for germination, right? Or it pops back out. Um, so these have a little more of a slicing effect. They stay a little sharper. Um, so we've liked those, but we haven't used them much. There's a close-up of the air cylinder for the, this is the cylinder that controls our row cleaners. And then this is pretty cool. This is neat technology. So this is a hydraulic cylinder. It's kind of hard to see, but can you see the hydraulic cylinder? And it's... It goes right up here in these arms. So most planters have springs. Um, so this is kind of a new technology that we're just trying, that we have for the last couple years that's quite nice for no-till in that it reads uh, the amount of pressure on the ground, the amount of pressure it's taking for the unit to get in the ground and stay consistent, but not over applying pressure. Normally in a no-till environment, if you have springs, you have to put enough pressure on for the hardest part of the field in order for all your seeds to get in the ground, which means in the areas of the field that aren't as hard, where you have less, tra less tracks, less, you know, less compaction, you're putting too much pressure on your planter. So this reads the ground three times per second, or something crazy like that, a lot, but will adjust on the go, and then also give us a map after we've planted, highlighting where we have compaction. The question was, uh, do we use cover crops uh, to help uh, even out the fields and get rid of our compaction? Um, we do that, we've, we've gone to zero tillage, uh, but there's still places in the field, um, in particular where the sprayers run. Uh, we're running 30 meter sprayers, um, but just like you guys, they're very heavy. So whether we're spraying corn, wheat, soybeans, when you've got a, I don't know how many liters, but a, a 30 meter sprayer with tires this wide, you get compaction. Um, we try to use the cover crops to alleviate that. Uh, but they aren't perfect because where the crop doesn't grow, the cover crops don't grow, so it never really fixes itself. Um, on the headlands, on the areas around the field where we have increased traffic, when we seed our cover crops, we add more daikon radish and more rapeseed to the edges in hopes of breaking up some of that compaction, and then we'll pull that out in the middle of the field. So we're trying to figure out how to get um, a better idea of how to precisely add cover crops um, one idea has been to go in and interseed radish on the headlands, on the, the perimeters of the field. The problem we had was when we did that, and then we drove our combines and our wagons over it, a lot of times the radishes would die where we needed them the most. Um, so we're still trying to figure that out, but we still have inconsistencies in the soil with covers, but much less so than when we didn't have covers. Um, but no, it is not a full answer to compaction. You have to be very careful when you get on your fields. You know, whenever we, like this fall was wet the entire fall. It rained from September through October. So I have fields that we harvested that were too wet. 
I, I know that I did it. Um, we did not want to, but it was either get the crops out and make a mess or leave the crop in the field. And as a farmer, we felt like we would be, it would be better for us to get the crop out of the field in the event that the, the corn was starting to rot, it was falling over, you know, to get it picked up. The beans were starting to go down. Um, so we have some fields where we added more covers. I'm not sure what we're going to do this spring. I may have to do some tillage where we had, you know, tracks from the combines. Um, we may have to get the disc back out or the plow. We don't mold bore plow, but a, a chisel plow. And even though it goes against kind of our philosophy, there's some times where that happens. Um, with us, well, the the question was, do we do we want to establish tram lines? I think we call them tram lines at home, where you don't seed, uh, where your sprayers run. Um, we thought about it in wheat, where we make multiple. In wheat, we're spraying um, four times. I think um, it's fairly intensive, comparable to Europe, and we run the same tracks. But even you get um, subtle tracks if you go back, uh, like. Um, these all have tracks, but we still get compaction because they're heavy. Even the combines, we get the biggest wheels that we can, but they still cause some compaction. Um, the, this is helping us. Once we get the map back, the map is per unit, so it's every 30 inches. It shows where the compaction was, and what that's helping us to do is figure out where our compaction is coming from and then we can label that, we can mark that next to where our cover crops are growing and see where we're creating problems. Um, like I said, this fall, I know we created problems, right? It was wet and we harvested, um, but we're hopefully gonna let the cover crops grow more. The more the cover crops grow, the more they break it up, the more earthworms you get, but uh, that's kind of our goal. These are kind of neat. Um, these are the seed farmers from the other one. Uh, we just tried these last year, and they're measuring uh, soil moisture and soil variability. In essence, they're measuring the quality of the seed trench as we're planting, including temperature. I don't think in a conventional environment they would be relevant. They're selling them for conventional farmers, but if you're plowing, this, the soil is going to be fairly consistent. This is nice because you can see as you're running the planter, as you get into different scenarios of cover crop, what's actually going on in the soil? You know, where have we dried it out? Where have we made it wetter? And we just experimented with them last year. Uh, we had quite a few of them break, so they weren't real reliable. But I think that by utilizing a lot of this technology, it can really help with the green side. Like, it doesn't make sense, right? Because the green people think that you shouldn't use technology. But I'm saying that if we use both and merge them, we can learn much faster. Um, so that's kind of, I'm a bit of a hybrid in that respect. Um, but I think that a lot of this technology can show that uh, we have a lot of fields where we'll spray one stripe and plant it brown and plant the rest of the field green to do yield experiments and everything else, right? We need to, I don't know that, the soil is so dynamic that you, you're always a student. Um, but with this kind of technology, I can see, was there less compaction where the field was green than where it was browned is what I think in my mind and what we're learning at this conference true or is it maybe not so true um, same with this seed trench is the temperature that much different at planting time where it's green versus brown or where we have rye versus barley where we have vetch versus clover where we have a 10-way mix versus a three-way mix great question the question was do we use precision agriculture so I was kind of building up through our system, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions as we go. Um, so we do everything as precise as we can. It doesn't always work. Uh, we hope that it works. Um, so we're using maps to determine our seeding populations. Uh, so this map is drawing on five years worth of yield data. So it takes five years of yield data and combines them all into one map. Uh, it normalizes the values of that five years. It really doesn't matter which crop it is because the normalization, the good spots of the field are usually good for corn, beans, or wheat, or whatever crop you grow, and the bad spots are bad. So by taking a multi-year analysis, we're able to get a really smart map. Then we'll take our soils map, 
uh, which is a government map that shows all the different soil types and make sure that there's at least a decent correlation to this. Uh, so you can see that some places we're planting uh, 94,000 seeds per hectare. And down here, we're down to 80,000 seeds per hectare. Uh, this is in corn. Um, beans, we plant much thicker, and that's because of slugs, which we will get into slugs a little later because they are where I really need some help um, because I don't have a solution for them in this system. Uh, but you can see that we vary everything on every field. And then I'll get into the nitrogen. The nitrogen is a lot more sophisticated now that we're using. Um, and with the satellite imagery that we're getting, it, I think it's going to be pretty exciting. So this is a typical uh, field. We carry the fertilizer on the tractor. Uh, we do that uh, because we want to disperse the weight. It goes back to compaction. We have bigger tires on our tractors than we do our planters. We don't run bulk fill. Uh, we, we run the single um, hoppers on our corn planters, and that displaces the weight as well so that we don't get so much weight uh, in the center of, the, of that uh, planter. So we're trying to eliminate or at least back off some of the, the uh, weight that tends to focus on the center of the planters. Our bean planters have central fill because it's so much higher volume. Uh, but this works for us, plus it gives us a little exercise uh, when we're filling because we use bags. Um, we get tractor gut in the spring and the fall. I'll get into some of the more planting green stuff. And, and beans and corn are two entirely different uh, ways of, well, wheat, first of all, wheat we plant brown. We harvest our soybeans and we plant wheat. Um, it's fairly simple. We no-till it. Uh, our, our ways of planting wheat have not really changed much. Um, we usually uh, harvest the soybeans. Uh, we spread about a ton and a half to two tons of chicken litter or chicken poop. Um, that's our phosphorus, our potash, and the base of our nitrogen in the fall. Uh, the wheat grows. We usually mix a little bit of radish in with it, with the wheat. Uh, and then in the spring, we do two separate applications of nitrogen and sulfur uh, with a little bit of fungicide. Um, we pulled out one of our fungicide applications, but we're still doing uh, one at flowering um, to help offset fusarium so that we don't get head scab. Uh, when we drill our wheat in the fall, we add about a pound of radish to it just to create a little bit of diversity. Um, then it'll die in the wintertime. Uh, but it doesn't affect the yield. So the radish, the idea of the radish is that it drills down deep into the soil and pulls your nutrients up. And then when it dies in the summer, the nutrients that were down deep will then go into, back into the soil and the wheat then pulls it up. About a pound. Uh, I don't know. Um, it would be uh, a very small amount. Um, a pound a gram. How many grams are in a pound? It's... 16, it's like 40 grams per hectare. Okay. 500 grams. So just one here, one here, one here. Um, it just adds a little diversity. We have, I, I figure anything that I can add that doesn't cost yield is probably good. Um, I think in corn eventually we'll start seeding some clovers and different things and interseeding them into the corn to complement but I haven't gotten all that figured out yet. Uh, with the cover crops, we've had to figure out which ones, there are certain crops in the system and certain plants that compete with one another. So at home, they call it an aleopathic effect, where uh, if you plant, uh, say, rye grass and you plant corn into it, they call it an aleopathic effect that the corn won't do well in the presence of rye grass. I think that's a fancy word for just simply saying that they compete with one another. The roots don't communicate well. There's a great book by a German author talking about how uh, the trees in the forest all communicate with one another and talk to one another. I highly recommend it. And I think that the same system applies even in crop fields, cover crops, everything. The roots, whether it's much more technical than me, but they're all talking to one another. So it's a matter of figuring out which crops essentially like each other. Um, so in the case of corn and ryegrass, in a natural ecosystem, they would be very competitive with one another. Um, just like in a, in a prairie or a forest, you don't have one tree or one grass that dominates the whole species. There's different things growing together in unison. Um, so we're trying to figure that out with the cover crops. 
Uh, and there's definitely some things not to plant with other things. Um, the soybeans love to be planted into cereals. Corn, not so much. Um, you start to run into nitrogen and issues and stuff. The, the problem with corn is if you plant into short cover crops, it works great. Um, so we'll start planting early. Uh, we're planting as early as uh, early March, which for us, our normal planting date would be April 15th. In the presence of cover crops, uh, we've started as early as March 30th, uh, the first week of April, we're planting. Um, it's, it's extremely um, risky where we are. We get frost, we get cold weather, we get cold rains, but if we leave the cover crops, which are only about this tall, they protect the grain in the ground. They protect it on top of the ground from frost, right? The frost will settle and a lot of times it'll miss where the row is down but they also protect under the ground because you've got all these living roots there and they're buffer it's buffering temperatures and providing a much better uh, nursery for those plants. So we'll wait to spray it. Um, and so far we've been doing it for four years and we've only replanted one field. So we don't go full speed, um, but we're trying it and trying to figure out why that is. Why can we plant so early? If we had, done, if we had plowed the field and done it conventionally and gotten a cold rain, we definitely would have replanted. The seeds would have rotted in the ground. Um, so by having that living cover, one of those things is it's opening up our planting window and it's also making the fields drier when they should be wet. You know, we're getting a lot better percolation rates, we're getting all that. The problem with corn is as, as we're planting, it takes us a long time to plant. You know, the planting window is about a month. So by the time we get to the end, so we started planting green when, the, when they're early corn and it was this big about 10 years ago and we never had a problem, well then we had fields that would get this big and be pretty scary. Um, they'd look like that. So the problem with corn is if, if, the, if the covers are over, was it two and a half millimeters, two and a half centimeters per inch? Is that right? What's an inch? Does anybody know an inch to centimeters? Twenty-five. So two and a half. So if it's over, um, if it's over forty centimeters, corn will get shaded. So if you plant into covers and you're trying to plant corn, if it's over forty centimeters, the corn will come up and look pretty when it's about this big, and then it'll twist. The whole plant twists, and in doing so, essentially becomes sterile. So we learn this. It's not sterile, but it'll just, the, the yield will go way down. Some plants will sterilize themselves. You get very low yields. So that's our roller. So that's fairly typical for us. Um, that was two years ago, and we've always been confused. The big question is, do you roll and then plant, or plant and then roll? Any suggestions? We switched, so I don't, I don't know what's right. Um, I have no idea. We. The typical rollers are very wide and they're solid. And the problem we have is that sometimes our fields are rolling, right? Whether it's old tracks, slight hills. And with the roller, you have to, our goal is to get to organic no-till, like the gentleman this morning. I think that's the idea, um, ideal agriculture, right? If you can do organic uh, and do away with chemicals and do it naturally, it's probably gonna be better than with chemicals. I mean, it just stands to reason that it's, or limit the amount of chemicals. Let's, let me use them more selectively. Let me use less. It's not an anti-chemical thing. It's a financial decision, an environmental decision, and a humanity decision. So I would like to get it figured out like the gentleman this morning, um, but they're obviously, they're, they're probably a little smarter than me. So we'll, we'll let them lead the way and I'll follow. But I didn't like the big rollers because you need to be able to get 
constant pressure on the ground so that in organic you can't, you have to crimp everything. Um, so we took an old cultivator from our conventional tillage days and then put these on and then welded uh, plates to it to kind of make our own, but that way we have about a 30% overlap between each roller, plus each roller is acting independent on that hinge point. So I think that in the future will be the answer to it. I don't have it yet. We're gonna hopefully build it when I get home, uh, but we wanna put hydraulic down pressure on it that we can control from the cab. So as we're going in the field, if you're in cover crop that's this big, you need a lot of pressure to crimp it. And by crimping it, um, does everyone understand what crimping means? You just want to bend it. The problem is if you cut it, if you, if, you, if you slice it, that plant will then come back twice as fierce. Um, so getting that balance is very difficult. So I think we need some type of hydraulic or air-assisted downforce so that as you're going through the field, and you get in different environments, regardless of the size of the machine, you need to have the ability to change the downforce of it in order to crimp. Um, one of our goals is also there's a, there's a clover. Uh, we've typically been using crimson clover, but there's another kind of clover called balanza clover. I don't know what balanza would be in French, uh, but it has a hollow stem. So the stem of the clover is hollow, so when you crimp it, it will die. Uh, so I think that's going to be one of the things we're not, currently when we crimp, we're not killing our clover, we're not killing our betches, we're killing the cereals, because once the cereal has lignin in it, once it gets to about flowering, it's really not difficult to kill with a crimper. But the timing has to be essential. You can only kill it at that point. Um, so we're not killing our clover, so now we're looking into different kinds of clover. That will have. Right, it's, it's a very fine line. And the problem is, it would be very difficult to run tractors in this fashion, right? Because one's always going to be, when you get out on the end to turn, the guy in front has to wait for the other guy to come out, so it would be very inefficient. So we thought, what if we uh, roll before we plant? You know, we could run the same tracks if everything's the same width. The problem then becomes the headlands. And planting into large green stuff, you have to plant the headlands before anybody drives in the field. Because no matter what the planter is, if you lay the straw over, the rye over this way and the covers over this way and have to plant this way, even with the row cleaners, the serrated disc openers, anything, nothing will cut through a mat of straw this thick. So we're very careful not to drive on the field prior to the planter going in so that the planter can do the perimeter of the field and then do the insides. So then we were thinking, why are we rolling first? Does it even matter? So now we plant and then run the roller behind it. The other problem is if the roller and the planter aren't in sync and it's been rolled over this way and you try to plant this way, it comes up like this and then it makes a tangled mess, which we've done that a couple times and I don't, I don't recommend it because the row cleaners get really tight and you end up with, with tools uh, getting them unstopped. Uh, so that's, that's why we built that crimper. It's not perfect. Um, we're still working on it. Like I said, we want to be able to get to variable pressures on it, and I think that'll make it a lot better. I think then the organic um, might be a little more feasible. Uh, we're getting to where we're using a lot less chemicals now, but we're still not eliminating them. I haven't had the fortitude uh, to try and eliminate uh, chemicals from my system. Each one of these has plates about this long that bend down. So they're kind of curved, so each one's curved. Yeah, that way as it rolls, it's not blunk, 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 blunk. It's yeah, there's one, these are about six feet, or um, shoot, these are about two meters. Uh, each roller's two meters, and they go across uh, the entire thing. Yeah, the, these little pieces are about 36 centimeters. Um, so we welded them on. The other style that is more conventional has like a chevron that goes down. Um, we, our team, uh, we talked about it and we thought that that might be a better system. Um, like I said, it seems to be working. I think they all work. Um, it's just kind of what we, it was inexpensive because we had this old frame was laying around. It's from con conventional agriculture, so there's not much resale on it. It wasn't worth much money, so we said, well, we've got the frame. All we have to do is, is buy these rollers and then weld the plates to them. And, you know, I had the whole thing done for about $6,000 because I wasn't sure 
the whole green agriculture thing, I'm still not real certain of. I mean, I've been doing it for 15 years, but it's still hard to sleep at night. So every year, <laughs> so every year um, we don't want to spend too much money on it in case we go back to plowing. Because at some point I'm like, it's still kind of crazy. Um, <coughs> so we figured this was easier than trying to buy um, a whole new op, a whole new thing. We could do it with minimal investment, um, try it, and it works well. Uh, so that's kind of where we are on that. The beans, we don't roll. Um, if we go to organic, we'll probably have to start rolling. I have a friend uh, in Indiana that's doing about 1,000 hectares organic no-till, um, and he's using a lot of the similar equipment. Uh, we talk to each other quite a bit, and his idea is the concept is because the cereals have to be flowering in order to roll and kill them, that means you're, if you're rolling and planting are dependent upon one another, then you can only plant when your cereals are flowering. But that might not be the best time to plant. So what do you do? question is, do you choose the right seeds of the cover crops? We've, I've tried that. That's a great idea. But what if, you, what if it's wet when the cereal's flowering? Um, so it becomes a bit of a dilemma. Um, so what he's decided is that he's going to plant his soybeans and then roll them when they're this big. Yeah, about 20 centimeters, I think. My math's getting... Mm -hmm. So it'll be cereal rye this tall. Soybeans, this tall, and then he rolls them. Done. And he's growing terrific beans. Our normal rotation would be um, corn, and then we would cover crop the corn, then we plant full season soybeans the following year, and then after the soybeans that are full season, we plant our wheat, which will be harvested the following June, and then we'll plant soybeans into the wheat as a second crop that year of the third year. Then we'll go back to corn for year four. Um, that's on a lot of fields. Fields that, that don't grow wheat well, we do corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans. Um, we don't have a lot of markets where I live that are alternatives to those three crops. Yes, the radish sown in wheat will die in the winter time. Um, it, gets, it gets below freezing. Uh, it takes below freezing for about three days to kill a radish. And we've grown, um, one of the experiments, and it reminded me of what you're doing on your farm, is we have grown wheat uh, with vetch as a complementary crop a couple times. Um, we have one field, it was by accident, um, <laughs> it was pretty, it sucked, um, probably the wrong word, um, but we got this beautiful purple flower throughout a wheat field. It was a field we started tilling, and the guy many years ago had planted vetch there that had gone to seed. Um, so we got a really beautiful purple flower in our wheat. Uh, so the local co-op, you know, the local chemical dealer said, oh, you have to spray it. Well, the wheat had already headed out, and we knew we would take a yield hit on it. Um, but actually, when we harvested the wheat, this has probably been 10 or 15 years ago, it yielded the same as it would have without the vetch. Um, we had to let the vetch mature in order to cut the wheat, uh, but it actually worked well and kind of let us think, kind of opened our minds a little bit that I think there are some complementary crops out there if we can just get it figured out. But I think it'll take a much larger group or meetings like this to kind of help us all learn from one another. Um, but the guy doing the, the soybeans while they're growing and crimping them, that's giving him an extra window of growth. So he's getting more biomass out of his cover crops as the soybeans are getting the early growth, and it doesn't hurt the beans to crimp them. But that got me thinking about corn. Right? Corn, if you chopped it, it would die. But what if we cut notches in our pieces here? We've got steering on the tractor. If you steer the tractor straight, you've got this band that's been cleared of the residue and cleared of the cover crop. For organic corn, in order to get enough uh, growth out of our legumes, they need to grow longer and longer through the season before they release their nitrogen. So if we have a clover with a hollow stem that we can kill with a crimper, can we make a crimper that can go in between the rows so once the corn gets about this high, run the machine through the middle of the rows, crimp that clover down, and then that nitrogen would then be released to the crop 
when it needs it. One of the unfortunate things uh, that we've learned with the legumes is once you kill them, the nitrogen is very mobile. You would think because it's organic, because it's formed by a plant, because it's fixed in nodules, that it would move through the soil very slowly and be a slow release, more like a manure. But in fact, uh, what we've learned through research is that the legume, once it's, it's dead, those nodules release very rapidly. So we need to figure out how to get that nitrogen available to the corn later. So crimping while we're planting, which is what we always thought we should do, might not be the best decision. So those are some of the things we're kind of looking at in the future in order to make it so that we can use less herbicides, um, which is one of our goals while still making money, which is always kind of one, is always the main goal because we want to stay in business. But I think the soybeans, if you can crimp them when they're this big, it actually helps their yields is what they're finding. So there's a lot of guys that are making extra passes. So we're going to try that this year. Um, we haven't tried it yet, but I think that that's one of my big goals for this year is to do um, at least a couple fields. Uh, that once the beans are up, uh, then, then crimping them and then not spraying them and see hopefully what kind of weed control we've got. My friend in Indiana, his conditions are very different. Uh, his soil is much better than mine. He's in an in a old prairie soil where the, you know, the topsoil is this deep and it's black. So his mineralization, you know, the amount of nutrients he gets out of his soil are much, much different than mine. My soils are this deep. Um, so very poor soils. Uh, we're we're uh, next to the ocean. Um, it's an old forest land. It's been farmed for a long time, not by European standards, but by American standards. So I don't have that mineralization that he has. We're starting to build organic matter on top. Uh, so where we've been doing the cover crops and we've had this cycle in for 10 years, uh, we're starting to get some black soil on top. We've got an inch or two that we've built. Um, so we're getting some, we're building topsoil, which is, is definitely a good thing. this is kind of an example of what the soil looks like after it's been planted. So we're, we're, we're clearing that with those uh, row cleaners. And that's giving us a nice seed bed. Uh, there's the earthworm, there's the seed. Uh, so this seed, uh, for those that plant pink seeds, we, we still use seed treatments. They're probably not good. Um, I just haven't had the nerve to try planting without them. Um, we still have them because we still have bugs, we still have worms. I don't know when that balance occurs where you can go without them, uh, especially if you're not getting a premium for organic. In conventional farming, the fungicide, I think, does a lot. And I think the insecticide, whether it's a neonic or a renaxapir, I think still helps with, uh, with some of the bugs. Um, so we are still using some insecticides. Um, I don't know if that's right or wrong. I know a lot of folks here aren't. And a lot of people say that once you get away from insecticides, you achieve a balance in the soil. I haven't seen that balance, um, so we still use them. But this, if you look at it, looks almost conventional. Um, so guys that haven't been no-tilling, like I said, if you go back to the fundamentals, they're all the same, right? It's, it's getting the seed in there well. This is I've, I've dug out. Um, um, we're running silt loams. So a fairly low percentage of clay. It's a silt loam. Um, I don't know what the actual percentage would be. It would be fairly low. Our, our cation exchange capacity uh, runs between 5 and 7, usually 5 to 10. So pretty low on the scale of, of soil quality. Organic matter is uh, 2 to 3 percent. I assume we're using the same scales of measurements here. Um, so by uh, Midwestern American standards, fairly low. And low in clay, I know that I drove south of Paris to visit a farm last week, and the clay was much higher. Um, I don't know. I guess it all depends on the situation. But that's, regardless of the clay content, I think you need to work that seed trench a little bit with your row closers. Um, that, to us, has been one of the keys to getting the, the corn up and to keep the ground from sealing over. Um, the problem we used to have in conventional tillage is you get a hard rain, and the ground would crust over. It would get real hard. Um, so by getting it worked up, by keeping it covered, we'd lose that, and that's avoiding a lot of replant that we used to have. And the soybeans, I think, like the tall cover. Um, it's odd. We've, we've had beans that we plant into the fields that are this tall, and everyone said to roll them, and we haven't been crimping them. We've just, we just let them grow. They're more difficult to harvest uh, because you get uh, the straw and the sickle. It's like cutting... Uh, uh, things that have been in, in wheat before. 
but the yields are definitely higher. Um, every yield trial we've done with brown versus green uh, in soybeans, the beans yield better in the green. Uh, corn, not so conclusive. So here's corn. So this was pretty good. Um, you can see where we've cleared the row. You can see the covers around it. You can see that. So now we'll come in and spray it. So we've been experimenting with the spraying. Um, I don't know that you could do it here. It doesn't translate because we're using GMOs and glyphosate. <laughs> so obviously that wouldn't um, work here. But I think that it's a, it's a nice system. I think it could be done here. You would just have to use a different blend of chemistry because um, all you really have to kill is your clover and your rye. So I think if you use a grass killer along with a broadleaf killer, um, not exactly sure what you have available, if that would be possible or not, because you don't have, the advantage you have is you don't have any other weeds. If your cover crop is planted well, if it's consistent, we found that it eliminates all the other weeds. Um, so one problem we have is glyphosate resistant weeds. Um, we have three that are glyphosate resistant uh, some of those are also ALS resistant, and they're also atrazine resistant. Uh, the quantity of glyphosate that we use, we usually make one pass, and we use one pound of, of active, which is kind of the recommended, ra or it's the recommended rate for us, so we don't go above or below that. Um, we're using a product from Corteva called Abundant Extra. It has the surfactant in it, and it's a six-pound material, so we're running um, 22 ounce, or yeah, but it would be Two and a half pounds per hectare. I'm sorry, it, that's pounds again, right? It would be, <laughs> it would be what's on the label. Um, what they recommend is all we use. Well, it'll start to compete. That's a good question. Uh, why we would want to kill the cover crop in the corn? Because I have been taught that that's the way to do it. <laughs> it may be wrong. I don't know. We're doing some cover crop planting. Um, while the corn's growing, when it gets to be about this tall, but that's simply to ensure it for the following year. Um, we haven't tried this. This, to me, would remind me of, of a weed that would compete with my corn, and I don't think we want the, the cereals in particular. Well, if we're using Roundup, we kill everything with glyphosate. Um, I don't know how you would selectively kill the rye and not the clover. I don't one of the big problems we have is the cereals tie up nitrogen. And not only do they tie it up, but they have a very high carbon to nitrogen ratio. So even as you apply nitrogen to the field, the straw sucks it up. And the bacteria that's eating the straw also sucks up your nitrogen. So we're not putting much nitrogen on up front. We're putting the 30 pounds with the planter, and that's it. Everything else is going on this corn plant post. Uh, it's going on after we've planted, after the corn's up when it needs it. So we're doing that like this. So this has a tube that drops down and that's where we're putting the nitrogen on. So it's a liquid. Um, I don't know what it is in, in uh, Europe. It's UAN, 32% is what we use. Uh, so we drop it straight down and we never had an issue. Um, we're doing variable rate. So we've got a program that knows our soils. Uh, they've done electroconductivity tests on the soils so they know what percent of uh, sand, silt, and clay they are. They're doing EC down, electric conductivity down to 90 centimeters. So they've got a pretty good calibration on that. They know the weather data from radar, so they know how much it's rained. And then in theory, know how much is leached out. So of the 40 pounds that I put down with my planter, it should know how much is there. And in addition, they're taking satellite pictures of the field and determining the crop health to see where the corn's healthy and where it's not. So that morning that we go to put the nitrogen on, we take that model along with a yield goal, put it into the sprayer, and then the sprayer varies the rate across the field based on that. One of the problems we ran into as we've been cover cropping is that when you have this thatch of straw, when you have all this residue on the ground and you put your nitrogen on it, the nitrogen gets tied up and isn't available to the corn. So we didn't want to go backwards. All the people around me that work in farming said that cover crops are bad, right? Don't do it. But I still think it's the right thing to do. So we bought these. So we used to do a single stream right in the middle. So we want some cover on the ground because that's what, what keeps the, the, the nitrogen from volatizing. 
the concern is that when you put UAN or 32% nitrogen on top of the ground, it volatilizes off into the air. If you've got something there to tie it up, it's better. So we put these on the boom, so it's, it's putting the nitrogen in two bands right next to the corn. Um, so there's, work, there's ways to work around a lot of the issues that we've run into. Um, we really like rapeseed. Yeah, how many units of nitrogen do we put on corn? Um, we put on uh, 37, 37 bushels per ton. So I'm sorry, 37, 37 units per ton. A pound per bushel. Does that sound right? 35 to 37 units per ton. I'm not sure if you're using the same units, though. Probably not. Uh, we're shooting for 200 bushels, and we'll put down about 200 pounds. We're shooting for... Um, we're backing off. The problem is where we're running, where we're using a lot of clover, we should be able to pull our nitrogen back. But we're still using cereal in the mix, so we're trying to figure out what that nitrogen to cereal ratio is. My goal would be to fix more nitrogen from the sky with the legumes to feed the corn crop. The problem we're running into is we don't know how much is getting tied up in the cereal, and it's very difficult to figure that out or it has been for us. So we're running a lot of trials. When we do the variable rate, so when we plug this in, in every field we're putting in test strips. Somewhere we're over applying nitrogen and somewhere we're under applying. And that hopefully, uh, given what we see earlier in the amount of crimson clover we have relative to the rye, we're trying to figure out what, how much less nitrogen we can put on is our goal. Uh, but the hard part is it, it changes so much, and the fields, when you plant a mixed cover crop, the fields tell you what you're high in nutrients. The, the gentleman this morning said that he had the same mix planted in two different fields, and they looked completely different. I've had that happen every year. So if you have a lot of excess nitrogen in your ground, and you have a cereal in the mix, the cereal takes over. If you don't have any nitrogen, then the crimson clover takes over. So to plan for the spring is very difficult because you have to actually look at the field and then come up with a, with a hypothesis on what you think is there, but coming up with a, a linear recommendation or a recommendation based on the soil is very difficult. In addition, you take the, the legume that's going to flush very quickly. It's hard to determine exactly how many pounds you're going to get from it. I read the textbooks and I'll say, well, if you have a good crimson clover crop, expect 60 pounds of nitrogen we'll use American measurements for, for the sake of the example. But you go out there and you've got great clover from here to the end of the table, and then at the end of the table, it turns to cereal rye and the clover smaller. So how then do you determine your nitrogen rate for the whole field? So we probably err on the high side of the nitrogen or on the low side of giving credit to the legume because of the risk, but we're installing tests all the time. Um, and that's kind of the best that I can do. That's the, the best way that we've figured out to do it. And we figured since the system is getting built over time, we're kind of tackling one problem at a time. So our problem, first problem was how do we plant through it? And I think we figured that out pretty well. I'm pretty happy with the way we're planting, the way our planters are set up. The next step is nutrients and herbicides. Our herbicide program this year is going to change drastically. We're going to put a lot more herbicides on the perimeters of the field and less on the interior because in the interior of the field, we're not getting many weeds. You know, we've got really good cover from the cover crops. The problem with the exterior of the field is wherever the, the sprayers turned, wherever the, the compaction is, wherever the deer eat, uh, wherever the wildlife damage is, if you don't have any spray, the grass and the weeds come up and it makes it very difficult and you don't get a yield on the perimeter. So we're going to do a different rate of herbicide on the edges than we do on the center for our residual herbicides. No, we cover crop every year but the wheat year. After the soybeans and after the wheat and soybeans we cover crop. 
Then after the corn, we cover crop. And after the full season beans, then we just plant traditional wheat. So it, wheat's technically a cover crop. I mean, it's doing the same thing, but it would be for harvest. Um, let me dive into one quick thing. So this is the electro, electroconductivity maps that they're doing at different depths. The depths are supposed to be on here. But this is giving the amount of sand, silt, and clay. Um, but it's kind of, technology is pretty neat. So this is our, this is a nitrogen model, but let me show you. Okay, so here's the satellite imagery. I think, it, I think it's available here now. But basically, uh, Planet Labs has two sets of satellites that run around the Earth, and they take a picture of every body's field every day. So this was an interesting, this field, it's one of our best fields. It's uh, about 200 hectares, or no, not quite, about 180 hectares, and it's irrigated. And I plant, this is the only field that we didn't plant green this year. Um, I was nervous. I was really shooting for high yields. Uh, so we left this field. This is May 4th. This was the green strip that we left. This is 30 meters. We left one pass of the sprayer that was this tall. So when we were out there looking at the field, as you walked across the field, you could hear birds chirping, right, singing. And of course, they were only here. So the ecological effect was there, but we were hesitant because we've had so many issues with nitrogen tie-up and corn that we're still learning, that we're still running experiments. Usually my experiments are the opposite direction, where we plant it green and leave one strip brown. This was the opposite. So this is saying we have really high plant health here, and the rest of the field is, is a monoculture that's, that's dead. Here you can see where we've, we've planted and sprayed, and the whole field has no life on it. Um, it's just a brown field with the corn starting to germinate. Um, so this was quite interesting. We had our year was very odd. It was a wet spring. We had more rain than we've ever had. Normally, our rainfall is about 120 centimeters. This year, we had... Wait. Normally, we have 100 centimeters, and this year, we had 180. So we, just, we had the, the most rain we've ever had in the history of my state. And it all fell in the spring and the fall, but we had a drought in June. So we had fields that had areas that had been flooded out and then hillsides that had been stricken by drought all in the same year. So it was a very interesting year. It, 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 was, it sucked, but it was, it was uh, interesting nonetheless. So this is June 7th, and you can see the strip that was green. So clearly in the corn, it's not as healthy. Rather alarming, right? Um, this down here is all slug damage. We had a hot spot of slugs in here. We know that they had eaten it off. Uh, but you can see that it's, it's clearly more yellow in variation. It's lacking nitrogen. Same planter, same fertilizer, same everything, but we had a, a clear tie-up from the green. So we're learning, trying to figure it out. You can see it. that's June 7th. June 15th, same thing, but it's starting to smooth out down here. Um, as we move through the season... Let me find it here. Here, you can't see it at all on July 4th. This is right after the drought. So everything's looking pretty good. It's getting drier. These areas are starting to die because it's so dry. There's no, no topsoil here. There's a, if you saw a topographical map, you would see that it's sloped. Topsoil's gone. It's a sand base. But if you get over here, as we get into the drought, right here is that streak. It's much more blue where we planted green. So our water holding capacity, our temperature variation are all shining through. In the irrigated portion, you see no difference. So that corn was able to catch up with time, telling us that we didn't get any, but the question was had we damaged it in the yield map? You know, once we, had we, if we took it to yield, would there be a difference? And what we found that there was uh, actually no difference, but you could still see a really nice contrast here, that same strip outside of the irrigation where it's drowned. You can see that the pivots, the big circle pivots running around, so it's got plenty of water. The streak doesn't show up in here. You can, I think I can see it because I want to believe that I can see it, <laughs> um, which is not very scientific. But down here, you can clearly see it. So that convinced us that you know, in order to, to build resilience to drought, uh, we really need to, to be doing covers, which is what's been preached here. I'm kind of just reiterating what every single speaker has said for three days. But here I have precision agriculture really proving the hypothesis of it and showing it throughout the season for us. So our question now is, uh, 
here, do we need to figure this out, do we need to fix it, or do we have a problem at all? A traditional agronomist, at least where I live, would be very concerned by that, right? They would say that, that, that you don't want the corn to be under any stress if you're shooting for extremely high yields. Um, so I don't know, based on that, I'd still like to figure out the nitrogen thing. I think I need more clover and less rye. Uh, so that's what we're trying to figure out is this balance. But as the crops grow, the ratios change in your cover crop. So you can't just say, I'm going to plant, you know, this year I could say if I had planted, if in the fall, when I planted my cover crops, I had said, I'm going to plant May 25th. Therefore, I need this recipe of clover, rye, and everything else. Where I live, it's wet in the spring. So I, don't, I could plant any time from April 15th to the end of May, depending on the amount of rainfall that we get. You know, if you live in an arid climate, it would be much different. So trying to blend those things out and figure them out makes it much more difficult, because here we actually ended up planting much later than I had wanted, much later than I had anticipated. If the whole field had been green, I was hoping to plant it when it was about that big, and when we got out there, the cereal rye was this tall. It was headed out. It was way, you know, so what's the... Coming up with those backup plans is the hard part, is how do you fix the nitrogen cycle if you get too much cereal? So, you know, that would have told me last fall I should not have planted the cereal as thick. I should have gone from 50 pounds down to 10 pounds. But if it had been early, I would have wanted 80 pounds instead of 50 pounds. So we're trying to constantly find this cycle, and you have to kind of go with the flow. And I think that the, the precision ag part of it, if we can bring industry in, you know, a lot of folks in the group here don't want industry in the green ag. And I'm kind of thinking, well, if we bring industry in with these tools and this set of stuff, I mean, it's, it, this stuff isn't, isn't size dependent. It's open to every farmer. Why don't we bring it in and learn from it and bring it together as a, as a, as a consolidation? I think it works much better because this should appeal to every farmer in the world, right? I mean, we all experience droughts. We're all going to experience more droughts probably. Um, so here's into August. It really shows up there. You can see it again there. I mean, it's a pretty stark contrast. And you can start to make it out a little bit there. I still think I can. And in there, it's really visible. And then that's the yield map. Um, it didn't show up as much in yield. So this, this, this map corresponds to bushels per acre. Um, which is, I don't have the key on here, but this would have, I'm not even gonna try and do the math, but you can see down here that it did yield better where it was green. And in the irrigated portion, if you pull it out, it looks like it yielded a little better. I did a, a computer analysis on it, but it was still not very, I wouldn't say that it was good data. I wouldn't say that I was confident. It yielded higher for those particular passes, but it wasn't enough that I would have confidence that it wasn't just differences in the combines. But down here, it definitely yielded better. You know, it was 20 or 30 bushels better, or about one to one and a half tons better where we had planted it green. No. It was about two and a half tons per hectare better where we had planted green than where we had planted brown in the presence of a drought. Yeah, that was last year. This was the only field that we didn't plant green. Um, every other field was completely green, and that was my last hold out, if you will. Um, we've been 100%, we've been over 90% planting green for four years now. Um, this is our, before that we were probably at 80%, then 70%, then 60%, then, you know, right on down. When I first started, I only planted into short covers. So if you want to start, to your question, uh, starting into no-till, whatever you plan to plant first, if you put the covers in and you plant the covers when they're that, this tall and then spray, that's the least uh, troublesome. You know, it's, it's easy to get the planter set. You don't need the fancy stuff on it. You can plant into it. You can spray it, and you're done. And it's just almost like, like uh, conventional. As you get into the taller stuff, it gets much more difficult. So we've slowly done the taller stuff. The taller stuff's much harder to sleep because you plant your crop into something this tall, and you don't see it for six weeks. I mean, it's literally six weeks, and you go out there, and you, you know, you're kind of going, and, and five weeks in, your soybeans are this tall, and you're going. Um, we had a, a field last year. I planted green real early, and then we did a late termination. So we seeded it, 
and then waited three weeks and sprayed it, and we planted it in early April, and we had all this rain, so the, the water was standing on the field for days. I mean, it just rained day after day after day. Looked horrible. Um, we went out and scouted it. I get scouting reports from the guys going to look at it. We all take turns walking fields, all my operators, myself. We all, I like everyone to look at the fields to see what's going on so we can collectively figure out what we're doing. Every picture, every scouting report, every stand count said, major concern, think about replant, lots of bugs, looks awful, everything. So we get into August, and I'm sitting there with my father and our fertilizer salesman in my office. And my, it was right next to where my fertilizer salesman works. It was right next to the fertilizer plant where he drove by every day. And they both looked at me, and they both think I'm a little crazy, as do most of the folks in my, in my, that I work with. They're all telling me what I'm doing is wrong and, you know, all that good stuff. And they both looked at me and said, Trey, you really screwed this field up this year. It looks awful. It looked awful when you planted it. It looked awful through the summer. Chalk it up to a learning experience and figure out how you will do it differently next year. So I kind of sit there like this. Two of the smartest men I know, right? I mean, my father is brilliant. I mean, he built the farm. He's a great farmer. The fertilizer salesman, same way. Great fertilizer salesman has scouted fields his whole life. I mean, these are two of my mentors. So... <laughs> so, um, oh, gotcha. <laughs> so these guys are, are telling me how, all, and I agreed with them, right? It looked awful. So the whole year it looked awful. We planted it, six weeks to come up, 10 weeks before you could ride down the road and see it. We've all walked the field. It's looked bad all year. Didn't have any weeds, but just had bad coloration. Short beans, the beans were about this tall. So I go out to harvest it because I wanted to suffer. And I said, I'll do it myself. So I'm driving. I look at the yield monitor. It's the best soybeans I've ever cut in my life. Ever. Probably would have won. If there was a contest for the record yield in my state, I could have won it. So that just went to show me that until you can get really good scientific evidence, it's very difficult to convince yourself that you're right. Because these two gentlemen that I was talking with have more experience in agriculture and are the best in their class, both thought that what we had done was wrong. Um, so I did not tell the fertilizer salesman my yield. I just told him it was a disaster because <laughs> I don't want my peers to do the same thing because I want to stay unique. <laughs> I'm happy to share in France, but at home, no. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So it's, um, and it wasn't really a, a great mix or anything. It just was a very uh, strange scenario. This is just some other precision stuff we're doing. So we work with the, the big companies as well. And we're doing, um, like this is a hybrid test uh, that Pioneer Seeds is doing or Corteva. But when we put the plot in, it's all green. <clears throat> so I'm probably the only one in the country that they're doing a test plot in, but we, they plan it, but we do it completely green, and we do it under my farming practices. So I figure that gives me, by inviting them in to do test plots on my farm, it's allowing me to see how these plots do under my conditions, um, which I think is kind of a neat opportunity. It's also part of the, the collaboration of bringing in big industry, and hopefully I'm influencing them to become more green as well, uh, without just them greenwashing everything and, and trying to, to do that. So by having their experience on my farms, it's helping. Um, like here you can probably see a little nitrogen skip from the sprayer. But uh, the, the question was, is it developing in the U.S.? I think the guys that are doing it, um, there's some that have been doing it longer than me, but there's a lot of us that are kind of in the same process as I am. I've been doing it longer, but I've been more slow to adapt to adopt it. You know, I've been... 15 years, which is a very, very long time, right? I mean, I was 30 when we started planting green. Um, and there's other guys that have started and got into it much faster. And there's much more knowledge out there now. But I think the guys that have started, I don't know how many people are starting now. 
You know, the, we call it the, the, the low-hanging fruit has been picked. You know, the guys that want to do it. If you don't have, if you don't want to do something better for the environment, it really does make your life more difficult. Probably not a very popular sentiment here, but it's harder to set your planner. It's harder to get your nitrogen rates right. It's harder to get everything set just right. I mean, it works when it works. Once you get it going, it works great, and I would never go back, and you'll never, you'll meet very few people that once they do it, ever revert back to the old way of doing it. But that initial process is quite taxing. Um, it's, it's worrisome. It's labor with your hands, but more with your mind, uh, wrapping yourself around it. Um, so I don't know in the U.S. if it's gaining a lot of popularity. Uh, the, the, the guys that are plowing in the fall, they put their nitrogen on in the fall. You know, they go in the spring. They hit it one time with a field cultivator. They plant, and they're done for the year. I mean, it's pretty simple, and they're making money. So why would you change and get slugs and bugs and, you know, all these other things? Um, so I'm not saying that to be pessimistic in any way. I mean, I think that everyone should do it, but... I think that it definitely takes a different mindset. And I think I'm going to get into the carbon market and things at the end of the talk. So I'm hoping that if we can develop a way to make it financially rewarding, then people will change. But I think the altruistic, I think in, in France it's different because you have more social pressure on the environment. You have more government regulation that you have to adapt to and you have to be ahead of it. Where I am in Maryland on the East Coast would be the most similar to France of anywhere because we have state laws that are more burdensome than the federal laws. So I've been forced to adapt to this because of social pressures from my community as well as social pressures from the, the government in the form of legislation that everyone to my west, with the exception of California, doesn't have. Um, and the power of the, the farmer in the Midwest is very strong. You know, they have a, a significant portion of the population involved in agriculture which is not a luxury that I have and probably not a luxury that you have in France or Britain. Um, so where I am, our voice is very small because it's a very small number of people. We tend to be conservatives when we vote. So we vote for the Republican Party. The rest of our state votes for Democrats. So the majority of our government in the state is Democrats and the majority of farmers are Republicans. So you don't get much clout. I mean, it's common sense. It's not fair. You can, you know, blame the system, but that's the way that it works. I live in a very liberal state, and I, I like it. I mean, I don't mind it, but that's just the, the, the way that my life is. Um, so I think that's what's caused me and some of the folks in my community to do this. Um, and then there's a few scattered around, but it's not a, a I, I would say the movement, it's hard to say because we're isolated in this meeting, but I would say that the movement is probably stronger here than at home. I think that all of the big companies, I deal with them quite a bit. Um, I try to network in every environment that I can, whether it's the green environment, the chemical environment, the machinery environment. I try to meet and know and learn from as many people as I can because everyone has something to offer. It doesn't matter who they are or what they believe, you can learn from them, right? Um, so within the, the industry, whether it's Bayer, Syngenta, or Pioneer, they all want farmers to be more sustainable doing what folks at this meeting are doing is a little over the top, right? It's a little outside. <laughs> it's, it's way to the, to the outside. But they all want everyone to be more sustainable. And I don't think it's just a company mantra. They, they're trying to be more sustainable. I mean, they're trying to get uh, buyers trying to be carbon neutral within a couple years. Uh, because, I mean, they have to. They have social pressures of the people that buy their products. And they want farmers to be more sustainable because they buy their products, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a collaboration. I mean, we all have to, if farmers don't make money, buyer doesn't make money. And if buyer doesn't make money, they don't innovate. We don't get new products. We don't get new technology. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's easy to say that they're bad or whatever, but I mean, that's, that's their goal was to feed the world and, and have farmers maintain food production, doing it sustainably. I'm not advertising for them. I have no vested interest, but that's just what I see from that environment um, and knowing a lot of those folks. I live close to where, uh, I'm very fortunate that DuPont is very close to where my home is. So I know a lot of folks, if they have someone that wants to do a farm tour, they bring them to my farm uh, to see. We've had folks from 50 different countries visit the farm because Corteva wants 
or DuPont Corteva wants people to see what a good, they believe that I am a good American farmer. But I'm way different than a lot of the peers, right? Um, so if they didn't like what I was doing, if they weren't pushing sustainable practices, they would not bring them to my farm because they would say that my farm is poor. This guy's farm is better. So I don't think that it's a us versus them. I think that it's more of a, a conjunction, and then we're always going to have folks that are, you know, from organic no-till to, you know, guys that are bad. But um, I was going to talk a little bit about pollinator strips, uh, some of the research we're done on, doing on the farm, and then uh, maybe some information on carbon trading. But I'm happy to go in any direction anyone might have an interest. So are there any suggestions or anything anybody would like to discuss? Okay. Can we get that to that at the end? Or you want to skip to that? Um, one thing that I think is getting overlooked in agriculture today is uh, the bees. And for us, it's monarch butterflies. I don't know if you have a similar uh, migration here. Uh, but at home, we don't have much habitat. We don't have many flowering plants. And uh, one hypothesis, I've read about it a little bit, but not that often, but it makes sense that as the climate warms, as, our, as the temperatures change, I think one of the problems that we're going to see uh, with the pollinator habitat and with insects and, and living organisms in general is that some things are calibrated on temperature and some things are calibrated on daylight. So the daylight's not going to change, but the temperature changes. So at some point, the bugs that are dependent upon temperature are going to become out of sync with the plants that depend on daylight. So I think that one of the duties as a farmer is going to be to provide excess habitat as everything starts to get recalibrated. You know, different parts of the world experience climate change differently, but it's clearly going to warm. So one of the, the hypotheses is in the, the bee decline, I mean, we have the, the virus that gets in the bees and kills the bees. We have insecticides that farmers use that, that contribute to the death of bees. But what are we doing to establish habitat as a society? Um, at least where I am, it's very little, right? You know, folks don't garden as much as they used to. Uh, homes don't have flowers like they used to. So to me, it's pretty easy uh, and not expensive for farmers to really contribute. To me, that's part of being proactive. Uh, so I'm looked at as a person that kills bees because I farm. Um, for those of us that use insecticides, I think that's a fairly common uh, conception among society that if you spray your fields to kill all the insects, then you're definitely killing bees, which we are to a certain extent, right, if there's something flowering in the field. Um, so for us, we've come up with some really simple strategies that one, I think, do, do good for the environment and, and, and the pollinators, but also do really well in talking to society and trying to relate farmers to the consumers, um, which I think is one of our duties. So one thing we do is milkweed is the only uh, food of the monarch butterfly. So for those familiar with the monarch, it migrates to northern Mexico every year, disperses throughout the United States, their numbers are in decline. Um, so wherever we have our uh, grassed waterways and field edges, we always mow. Um, not to the extreme that the French do, but all of our owners typically want their field edges mowed, right? It looks neat and clean. So we've gone through and talked to all our owners and said that, hey, if we have milkweed on the edges, we're going to start leaving it. So they're seeing the moths, they're seeing the monarchs. The other thing is that when we cover crop, so this is our cover crop, this is the field that we've planted, and we just laid the sprayer off three feet. Very simple. Actually works out good because then we don't have to worry about the operator with the 30 meter booms killing the grass of the owner, <laughs> which is always bad. But we've got it laid in a little bit and we've got a great pollinator strip. Uh, the beans end up coming up through it. It also gives us a kind of a look, a little micro look at what organic, not not, sp not rolled, not sprayed, not anything, what will those beans look like? Let's get an idea of what beans growing through cover crop that gets to go to seed will look like. Um, so it's really little things, but this owner called me and he just said, man, the farm looks fantastic. Um, you know, so that's a great appeal to me. 
um, you know, neighbors see it, uh, people in the community see it, so it really works nice. The other thing is we're putting, making sure that we have, we put rapeseed in every acre that we plant and cover crop. Rapeseed is, is very inexpensive, but it flowers early. So all of our fields have yellow flowers uh, in the early spring. And I think that, you know, you walk the fields and you can hear the bees buzzing. So that to me is showing that it's, that it's thriving. Um, it's just made us rethink and uh, change the way that we're applying our insecticides. We used to, every acre we planted, we used to put a pyrethroid on. Um, pyrethroids are a um, insecticide that kill everything, right? They're, it's a non-selective, kill everything herbicide. Uh, so we've pulled that out of our system. Uh, we're no longer doing, um, the only time we spray pyrethroids is if it's based on scouting and bug counts based on levels that it'll damage the field. Um, but I think all of those things are kind of helping uh, with us. The question was, is, is rapeseed good for bees? Did you say if it's GM? This would be non-GMO. I don't know that there's a difference, but we're not raising it as a crop, so what we seed, what if it's non-GMO? Is it good for bees? No, I'm asking, you would know better than I would. Oh, really? I'm not defending myself, all of our cover crops are non-GMO. Just put that out there, but um, we do see a lot of bees in the fields with the rape. Uh, that seems to be the earliest flower we can find. Um, so that's just one of the things we're doing, but I could be wrong. Anything I say can be wrong, right? <laughs> it, it, it should make sense. I think that in time we should be able to see, now that we have so many different programs that are continental, um, I'm curious to see with the, in particular, the banding of neonicotinoids in Canada and Europe, if we'll see a difference in the bee populations of the United States versus Europe and Canada. If the hypothesis is true, if the scientific community is right that neonics are killing bees, then we should see a difference. I mean, you can't get a bigger experiment than two continents, right? Um, so to me, it's good. And if we find that uh, the scientific community of Europe is right and the scientific community of America is wrong, then hopefully America will follow suit or vice versa, right? Um, I doubt it would go vice versa, but um, it would be interesting to see if that fixes a lot of the issues with bees. I don't know. Um, the neonicotinoid thing is a little different because it's the, the exhaust coming off the planters. Um, so I don't know if we'll see a huge difference, but maybe we will. Um, maybe the, the ag community of the U.S. is wrong. Um, I try to stay open-minded on that. So, I mean, all that information is good. I've heard the GMO with the rapeseed before. Um, so we're just trying to do uh, what we can. I think all farmers need to and learn this kind of stuff. I think that we all should be putting some pollinators out um, because that way, regardless of the, it, ma it makes it a lot easier if someone attacks me for killing bees, that if my rebuttal is not neonicotinoids are good, they don't kill bees when I don't really know. You know, I'm doing the best I can with them. We went to poly instead of graphite and we've changed the way we plant and we put hoods on the planters, but Honestly, you know, it's not my job. I mean, it is my job, but it's not. It's above my pay grade, we would say. Um, but if I can say, well, hey, rather than, I'm not, rather than defending something that I don't really know, I can say, well, I'm providing habitat. I'm trying to help the situation as opposed to just not doing anything. Uh, um, and I think that's what farmers around the world need to do. It's a slightly different dynamic in France, obviously, than it is where I am. England's probably, you know, every country has their different social pressures. In France, people pay a lot more attention to what they're eating and where it comes from than where I live. Um, I think there's a lot higher value, a lot higher percentage of a person's income goes to food in France than where I'm from. So I'm trying to educate people so that they, in the United States, will pay more for food because I want my food that I grow to be higher value. Um, that's one of the reasons I do what I do. I think that what I'm doing is better but I want people to know that, and hopefully I can market that. Now, in the U.S., no one seems to care, right? You know, I'm doing all this stuff. And, right, so far, but, you know, it, it is what it is. You know, I'm, a, I'm in the commercial scale. I'm in the industrial scale world, so it's not, um, it's very difficult to add value when you grow corn, wheat, and soybeans. We all, I think that's universal around the world. Um, so trying to figure that out, whether it's, um, you know, grinding the flour to make bread. Um, I thought the gentleman yesterday with the horses, Terrific model, um, you know, can, 
I mimic that on my farm on a larger scale, not be as artisan, but figure out how to market up, you know, how to vertically integrate my farm or take a group of farms that farm in a similar fashion and integrate up the, the chain, which I think is, it, it would get rid of some of the big global, we have these big global companies that control the whole food supply for the world and the farmers are getting left out of that profit center, but you have to differentiate before you can integrate, right? If you're going to vertically integrate, you can't be selling the same thing. Um, so I think one of the goals is to be more environmentally sound, to get our carbon footprint down, find a group of farmers that are local, you know, make a co-op like they did in the olden days, and hey, here's your bread. It might not be the artist that we saw yesterday, of course, but it could be a better product, a product where the yeast sits for two to three weeks instead of four hours, where it doesn't affect people's gut the same way that the mass-produced bread does today. Um, so that's kind of my goal. What that looks like with chemicals and different things, I'm not sure. Um, like I said, my goal is to use less chemicals, but I think in going organic, you're really taking a huge risk financially because I don't think that people fully understand the dynamic in the 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 fluctuations of insect pressure and weed pressure and different things. Um, I think it's still a risky endeavor unless you're really, really smart and can really figure things out. Um, but I think it's coming, but it's just a, it, it's, it's tough to do. And then finding markets on top of that, uh, where I live, we have a huge demand for organic corn and soybeans to feed chickens on mass scale. It's the largest demand of organic feed in the world. Well, I should be growing organic then, right? Because there's huge demand. The problem is the company that's growing the chickens is now sourcing globally. You know, they've set up a team that sources organic food around the globe. So I'm not competing with my neighbor. I'm competing with Ugandan farmers that have never had chemicals in Uganda. They're not sitting out for three years. They're going from growing herbs from Europe for Europe to growing soybeans for the U.S. Pretty simple, right? They don't have to worry about, not go, about mecha, mechanized weeding because they have hand weeding. Um, farmers in India, there's big pockets of India that have great soil that can grow organic, but not the same pressures and not the same pay scale that I have. So it, even though my demand went up, the price has stagnated or gone slightly down, which then I went, well, time I do my three-year transition, if they find a great big market in Uzbekistan, you know, the freight rate from Uzbekistan to the United States it's like $35 a ton, right? You know, we get beans from Sao Paulo. They pull them up for 30 bucks a ton. It costs me that much to truck my beans 100 miles. Uh, you know, I mean, that, it's a global market, and, and freight across the ocean is not very high. You know, the freight rate to Europe from the U.S. is very, I mean, you guys have been competing with us forever. I mean, you're going, we're going through what you guys went through. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm the American. I'm the last person that should be saying this, right? You know, I mean, we, we've, we've been doing it with big fields and, you know, all this different stuff. So you guys are used to it. We're not, we're not very comfortable with it, or I'm not very comfortable with it. So I'm trying to figure out how to get more like a French farmer, but I'm trying to figure out how to adapt to that environment and how to vertically integrate. And the organic, I thought five years ago, was the answer. And then once they started sourcing globally, I realized that that's not a competitive product for me unless I can find it has to be organic domestic, you know, we need another label, you know, and how do we do organic domestic and how do we prove that organic domestic is a better product than organic imported? And right. So in, in France, I agree, is doing that is doing that now because folks here care more about what they eat. You know, so I think it's a, it's a you guys have kind of an added advantage there where people are willing to pay more for a domestic produced product than a foreign one. And where we live it's very difficult. The consumer is so uneducated on what they're buying, I think, across the board, less so in France, but more so in other parts of the globe, that they think organic is better when the carbon footprint a lot of times on organic is very poor. You know, if it's going from, you know, a Ugandan farm to a truck in Uganda to the port to the river to the U.S. to unload to 100 miles, you know, I mean, it's going all over the world, plus they're plowing, they're doing things that aren't good for the environment, they're taking savannas out of production or out of, you know, grazelands and turn, but anyway, it's, um, the consumer thinks what they're doing is better for not just themselves, but also the environment, when a lot of times it's, it's counterintuitive, but as commercial farmers, we have to have a better product to sell than just plowed ground with 
you know, tons of nutrients and inputs because that's not so appealing either. Um, that doesn't that doesn't garner someone to pay more. So that's kind of what we're uh, targeting. And that's part of the, the reason I'm doing farming the way I'm doing is altruistic. I think that it's better for the world, but I need to figure out how to make more money with it because I think that there is, is potential for that. I think that's why everyone's here learning um, as well. So this is kind of the slide I showed the other time. The, the cover crop, um, getting it crimped, we've already, I've probably covered most of this. I've never talked for two hours before, so you have to bear with me. Um, cereals going to head is a big thing in beans. Um, like I said before, we've learned that the hard way, but I don't know how to avoid that. So that's very difficult. If you get a wet spring, we run into all these weird dynamics where the, the crops just grow really fast. And like they were talking about yesterday, the roots grow so fast and the top grows so fast that in one week you think you're ready to plant and then you go back and the, the cover crops this tall and you go back a week later and it's this tall. And it, it, uh, once it goes to seed, when you go to harvest it, it makes it very difficult. Plus, you get a whole different carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, and then slugs are probably our biggest issue. Does everyone here know what a slug is? Um, so that's what we're using. Um, we've also found that if we take potash, uh, we have a local fertilizer company that does what's what they call suspension potash. So they take potash is normally large uh, granules and they take what's left over at the mill, and it's not quite a powder, but it's very uh, fine. They mix it with clay, and they suspend it in a liquid, so it's kind of the consistency of like a milkshake, but it's got a lot of salt. I don't know what it does for earthworms, but I assume if it's killing slugs, it's probably not good for earthworms, um, but it does take care of the slugs. It helps if we can get sun on it and the metaldehyde. I'd be open. Does anybody have any good solutions for slugs other than tillage? Um, the predators was the response. I've been thinking about that. That's why I'm trying to pull the, the, the one, there's one hypothesis at home uh, that the neonicotinoids, the slugs eat the seed and the, the crop, the neonicotinoids in it, then the beetles eat the slugs and die. Um, so we're in essence killing off all of our predators by using it. So my one friend that I've referenced a couple times from Indiana, uh, he claims that it helps. And then there's a company called uh, Xerxes. Um, I think they're Canadian. And there are people, it's a society for insects. Uh, so we're trying to learn how to build uh, homes for uh, beetles. So there are mounds that are elevated. Uh, and apparently these ground beetles can run a great distance. Uh, we haven't done that yet, but that's probably our biggest challenge of our whole system. Uh, the planting green, everything else is fairly simple once you get it down, but once those critters set in, they're, um, they're a vicious animal, and I haven't really found a good way to kill them. We've tried uh, nitrogen at night while they're out on corn. That didn't work. We tried lanate, which is an organophosphate that basically kills everything, including people. That didn't kill them. Um, we have found that by clearing that row, by getting some distance between the, the, by keeping this two inches on either side, it does protect it somewhat. Um, that's one reason I like the row cleaners, because they'll stay somewhat in the, in the, the residue that's in between the rows. Uh, so by having that little bit of bare dirt there, they don't cross it as often. Uh, one thing we have documented over several years and scouting is that they are worse where you plant green than where you plant brown. Um, it's pretty much a fact. We've tried. Uh, there were some people in Pennsylvania that said if you leave the field green, they won't affect your crops as bad. You know, if you delay the spraying or you de delay the crimping. I've tried that. I don't think that it helped any. Um, I found that they still like those little seedlings, so I haven't, we don't really have any good solutions there. Here's some research that we're doing. I think I showed this slide the other day, but I'll go back over it. So this, this gentleman here is Ray Weil. He's with the University of Maryland. He kind of started the whole cover crop uh, movement in the United States about 35 years ago. And I always thought he was like a crazy old guy. He wears that hat, he's got a ponytail. Um, not kind of my typical agricultural person. But I did a program uh, 
with a foundation, and they sent him to help me learn how to cover crop. Uh, so he taught me a tremendous amount um, about how to manage cover crops, some different ideas, uh, how to get my mixes right, how to really get the soil to become alive. Uh, he's written the basic textbook for most of the universities in America for soil fertility. Uh, but he got us to do 15 strips on the home farm. So we had this trial, which is cereal by itself, uh, early mix, or mix early, mix late, no cover, and straight radish. And we replicated it three times and then did a variable rate, nit variable rate nitrogen trial on top of it the following spring. And they pipetted uh, the groundwater throughout the entire winter. And this is the, these numbers got cut off, but this was the amount of nitrogen that was in the water that was going down through the soil. So you can see that it was three times more where there were no cover crops. So we did this research about four years ago, and it was quite, quite convincing, quite telling. Um, so he's been on the farm. He's doing research now. Uh, we teamed up with the local, uh, do you guys have uh, river organizations in France? public uh, groups. So we have river keepers where we are, and they're very, very liberal, um, very environmental, very far to the left, uh, typically very anti-agriculture. Uh, so our river keeper where I happen to live is very pro-agriculture. Uh, they feel that if farms go out of business because they're over-regulated, what happens to the ground and the farms will be worse than what the farmers are doing. Um, because it would go into development, it would, be, it would just become a town, it would become another strip mall. Uh, so they've been working together. I'm on the board of our local river keeper, and what we've done is we got grant money so that this guy can come do research on seven different farms in our watershed around these rivers. They're small rivers, it's not like the scene. Um, they're isolated rivers that feed the Chesapeake Bay, and they're doing research on cover crops, and biomass accumulation to see when the best time to seed the cover crops is, what the best mix is, and how to seed it, whether it's with, a, with an airplane or a, you know elevated machine that does it during the crop, or whether it's uh, us drilling it in the spring. So it's been a nice um, collaboration where we've got folks that typically don't like farmers. Um, the Riverkeeper model is to try to get rid of farmers, or they want everyone to be organic and no-till, which is not a very um, good model, you know, right? I mean, there's not many people doing it. Uh, so we've had it pretty good where we've kind of come together and we're doing really good research. Uh, the research is then presented at a uh, Shore Rivers or an environmental meeting, but it's only farmers that are invited. Uh, so we had about 90 farmers at our meeting on Tuesday. I was not one of them. Uh, but it's been a really nice experience and it gets the farmers a lot more uh, socially accepted within our community because it shows that we're trying to work. It's building transparency, which is something that's very foreign to us as farmers. And I think the French farmers are probably similar in that respect, that we don't want people to come to our farm, um, particularly people with preconceived notions about farming, regardless of the type of farm. And we've kind of gone under the, the idea that we need to bring people in, show them what we're doing, and maybe change what we're doing a little bit in the process, but uh, it's worked out nice. Then I met um, Steve Mursky. That's not him, that's one of his PhD candidates. Steve Mursky works for the United States Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. and uh, at a facility called Beltsville. He's a cover crop expert as well, so they're pulling cores uh, four feet deep uh, to try and find out what the effect of what I've been doing over the last years, where that nitrogen is, and where it's starting to affect. Because if you study nitrogen and its, its effect on the pollution of waterways, oftentimes what's going into the river or into the sea is 20, 30, 40 years old. So for us in the Chesapeake Bay region, we've changed the way we farm, but the bay was not getting any cleaner. It was very frustrating for farmers and the environmentalists, but once we learned that the, as the ground, as the nitrogen goes through the soil, it gets into the aquifer, 
and goes out through the sea. So a lot of the nitrogen that we're seeing might not have even been applied in my lifetime. So what he's doing is pulling cores four feet, which is tracking nitrogen back several years to see what the effect of planting green and cover crops is having on the environment through history. So that's giving us a better idea. So while the bay is getting cleaner, now I'm starting to get some, stati some statistics on how much nitrogen is actually leaching through the soil based on my farming practices. In addition to that, we're spraying fields, the, the field that I showed you earlier that had the strip. He's studying those. The hypothesis for me is that the temperature doesn't change as much in covered soils. It's pretty basic, right? And I think that the water holding capacity increases, the porosity increases, and the amount of nitrogen leached decreases. But that's counterintuitive because if you have more water flowing through the soil, more nitrogen should go. But to me, as soil health builds, you get a better balance and it goes through. So he's set up lysimeters in the soil that have a, a, a solar panel on them. So in real time, he's measuring what the effects of the weather are in the soil in brown planted versus big cover crops. Um, so I wanted to have the statistics to present here, but he doesn't have them done yet because of the government shutdown we had. Um, but what he's doing is then helping test that hypothesis in real time. So if we get, we have a lot more huge rain events than we used to. We're getting more rains, and that's supposed to be predicted for the future. Uh, so the, the idea is to figure out how is our soil reacting to planting green versus brown, big covers versus small covers, but do it in real time so when we get that rain event, we actually have data throughout the rain event. You know, if we get an eight inch rain or a 24 centimeter, 20 centimeter rain, we know exactly what happened in the soil, how much nitrogen went through. So it's not just the model for my precision agriculture, but I'm getting a third party scientist to help back that up. Um, and then hopefully that'll correlate with my high tech stuff. And then I've got the whole team put together. Um, and then that way we can start to learn how much nitrogen we need on the corn in the presence of clover and vetch and these different legumes along with the, the, the cereals. And the other big question is when are the cereals and everything else as they degrade all the nitrogen they pulled up, when does it release it? Does it release it when the corn needs it? Or is it after the corn needs it? If it's after, then we have a problem. And then as you get multiple years, do we get into a into a cycle that's smoothed out. So we don't have these ups and downs, but we have it just where it's kind of, where the nitrogen cycle's cruising along. You got your cover crops, you've got living roots all year. At that point, then I hope we can start to calibrate our really, really well, get a really good calibration of our corn nitrogen needs rather than just going to the field and seeing the clover and trying to guess, is it 30 pounds or 40 pounds? Is it consistent, is it not? We'll have a more smoothed out um, soil structure and everything will be a, a better equilibrium. Um, so these scientists are really doing a lot to help with that. Uh, so they've been very supportive. Um, this lady, she's from New Zealand. Um, so she was hired by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, which is our largest environmental group in our region. Uh, it's uh, $45 million annually. Um, they asked me to be also on their board um, which is very uncharacteristic, right? You have this big farmer that's on the board of environmental groups. So they're, we're both taking a risk. Um, so they hired her, and she's into um, soil health, but she's a little different. Um, she's into more biodynamics and adding different sugars and different things. Uh, so I'm going to do some work with her. She seemed really smart, um, so I'm pretty excited for it. But she's uh, pretty much no chemicals, um, biodynamics, very little fertilizer, but adding um, hummus and, and uh, not hummus, um, humic acids and sugars and all these different things that I'm unfamiliar with to kind of get the soil jump started on biological activity. Uh, but her, her basis and her facts behind it are awesome. Um, so she seems to indicate that once we get this, this soil health established and we get everything jump started, and it makes sense because if you look at all the companies in America and probably Europe too that are developing biologicals, they keep saying we're developing these biologicals that are going to be very expensive so you can use less fertilizer. But it stands to reason that if we have healthy soil, we shouldn't have to purchase biological 
agents to help our soils. So I think that once we get the soils healthy, we can take a lot of what the biological folks are learning and just figure out how to master it so that we've got it in the fields naturally because they're all naturally occurring things that we've eliminated from our system through tillage, chemicals, and everything else. So I think uh, by bringing in different folks like this, she's a little out there, um, or she's a little different than the person that I normally work with. Uh, she works in a lot of pastures and stuff. I'm not sure how this will translate. This is a uh, model built in Colorado. Uh, it's a soil carbon um, model that you can put your farm in. So this is what I'm trying to figure out is how much carbon we're sequestering. Uh, I want to know for personal, my personal self, because I think that's what's important, but I'm starting to, they're starting to develop marketplaces for the carbon, and I think that's going to be a big point of change. I don't think it's going to be a lot of money, uh, but I think as farmers see that there's an economic incentive to do it, myself included, we run it through the model, and then we can get it. So I have a short video. Thank you for your interest in the Comet Farm tool. Comet Farm is a conservation planning tool developed by the USDA's yep. Natural Resources Conservation Service. We might not need the Colorado words. State University. The tool was developed to help agricultural producers who voluntarily want to be part of the global It's those groups solution. trying to figure out the carbon footprint the of different farm farms. Uh, so they developed this model together so it's a government agency and uh, university that have developed it. And parcels, either by drawing polygons on a map or by defining a point location in a field. Users may add as many fields as they would like. So you put your fields in the soil and then put in everything that you do. In order to establish a proper baseline, users begin by describing the historic land use and management for their fields. They then have the option of describing in detail the crops grown over the past decade, describing planting This is us putting in all our planting dates, nitrogen rates, village, inputs. Fertilization. So this seems to be the accepted model for the U.S. I think there's a different model here in France, um, which I'm fairly excited to learn about to see if it might be better. This one has some things that I don't care for. It also has, it does not take into account cover crops at this point. Cover crops are not common enough that they're not built into most models, particularly high growth cover crops, which is, I think, what really sets, it makes a huge difference in carbon sequestration is whether or not you're growing a second crop. So. We're pushing them to try to figure out how to do that um, through the next company that I'm dealing with that uh, is trying to establish the marketplace. In order to more fully assess a whole farm operation, Comet Farm also allows users to enter and evaluate. But the initially, they're thinking that it'll be roughly 25 to 40 dollars per hectare if we're no-tilling, cover cropping, and growing a crop and not baling any straw or taking off silage, you know, leaving all the residue behind and also growing a big uh, cover, which to me sounds pretty good. Um, the problem is my farm has to be transparent. Thank you again for your interest in um, That, as a farmer, is fairly scary, right? We have to put out there what we're doing, put it into a blockchain, which does everyone know what a blockchain is, or roughly? A blockchain is essentially a spreadsheet in the cloud that can never be altered. Once it's there, it's permanent. You can put bad data into it, but once it's there, it's done. So what the model will do is take all of our data from our yield maps, very scientific, it's got to be all verified. Right? It's not going to be any opinion. What kind of tractor you run? How many few gallons per hour did it burn? Pull it off the monitor. All that gets put in there, and then you send it up to the cloud, and then they determine who, then we still have to determine who has access to this. How much nitrogen? Nitrogen is a huge consumer of carbon, right? In order to make uh, the 39%, or anhydrous takes a tremendous amount of energy. You know, how, that's one of the big factors. Um, so all that's coming about, the, the thing that scares me, obviously, is the transparency. Um, they seem very excited about it. There won't be any financial things in it. 
Uh, the other thing is once they establish the blockchain, they want to the marketplace that I'm looking at uh, wants to play wants to pay with a cryptocurrency, which was even scarier, right? Because I don't know what cryptocurrency or blockchain are. But when explained, the cryptocurrency is actually a fairly good idea because it becomes a standard measurement of payment. And it also allows us as growers, once you receive that payment for that cryptocurrency or you hold the cryptocurrency, then as you think the market is developing and you think that cryptocurrency is going to increase in value, you can then start to play the market of currency evaluation. Just the same as you would a corn or a soybean or a wheat market on futures, it becomes a, a publicly traded futures commodity of the carbon, which when they explained it to me like that, it made sense, right? I mean, I, we do that every day uh, whenever you're selling commodities. It's not something that's foreign. Cryptocurrency is foreign to farmers, but, but rolling futures in commodities is not foreign. Um, so once it was portrayed in that nature, I said, well, this makes sense. The blockchain makes sense. If I can put it in there, if I can get to be carbon neutral. So one of my goals as a person that wants to vertically integrate or develop a premium for my product is to get a carbon footprint on the farm. That to me is the future of food. The future of food is not organic. It's sustainably grown, right? It's, and what's sustainable? It's what your carbon footprint is. Essentially, I mean, there's a really a direct correlation to that. The, the, mo the easiest way to simplify food production is to give your carbon footprint. The, the farmer that is sequestering carbon, I would argue, is always going to be doing a better job than the farmer that is not. So that eliminates the organic folks that are doing overtillage, and it eliminates the conventional folks that are doing overtillage, right? So if you're sequestering carbon, you're doing the best job for the environment, you need to have it all verified. So the, the thought process, the, the, the long-term goal is that if we can get the carbon market established, they do the verification for me. They do the verification for you. So you have your carbon footprint based on the carbon market, and then they take that to the public because they're popular, as opposed to me taking it to the public, because I'm the large-scale farmer that no one respects. Right, So I think that hopefully it'll come, it's five, ten years down the road, but hopefully as consumers become more educated, they can go to the grocery store, see their package of chicken, scan it, and see that I grew the corn for that chicken. And they can see the chicken farmer that grew it in his chicken house. And we each have a profile. We'll have a story. Uh, for young folks, they all say millennials want stories, right? Not facts, they want stories. Well, let's, let's tell our story. Let's have it transparent. Let's have it in the carbon market, let's have it blockchained. Then we're talking the language of folks that are younger than myself, but they're going to relate to it because that's what they want. The, the, the young folks of Paris want to be able to scan their beef and see where it came from. The young Parisians want to know where their chicken came from. And I don't think that they care if the farmer's big, small, or indifferent as long as he's doing good. Um, so I think that trying to develop these markets on a larger scale is imperative to the future of food production, and it gives us a way in. It gives us an entry point. Be carbon neutral. Improve your soil health because you're making money doing it anyway. You're, you're investing in your soil. You're investing in your future. You're investing in what your kids are going to take over or what you're taking over as the child and improving everything, but let's figure out how to monetize it is always the hard part as a grower. Uh, so if we can monetize it through carbon trading, through getting the blockchains established, but getting an outsider to do all the technology part since we're not necessarily that strong on technology. We're probably not, I'm not a big blockchain person. I don't have the working knowledge to do that. But if I can partner with uh, the other group, can we turn the other one on? The, no, this is a private company. It's a startup in Seattle uh, called Nori. There's a couple of different groups um, that are trying it. I don't know if it's gonna work but I figured it was worth the time and the investment to try to get it established because if the marketplace can get up and running, I think that it can really start to bring other farmers like myself into the realm of value added. Um, if we're growing things better, um, we've heard here that the nutrition is higher in the grain that's grown green in living soils. So if my corn is a higher nutrient level, which I don't know if it is or not, I'm basing that on what I've heard here, um, then hopefully I can get more money for it. 
Um, so it's kind of a combination of, of doing well for the world and trying to kind of keep up with, le- with regulations and keep up with legislation and environmental community, but then figuring out how to take that, all that adaption and adoption and make it profitable. Um, and if it is more profitable, that allows us to put more money into research, whether it's on farm or by paying people, but it gives us the ability to take more risk. It gives us the ability to plant into taller, greener stuff. You know, then we can take a five bushel yield loss on a corn crop or a two bushel yield loss on a bean as a risk, as a calculated risk to learn, but be able to do it that way. So that I think is, is what I'm trying to, to kind of get to this point, but it's been like a 15 year deal. So if everyone moves as slow as me, we're in trouble. Um, so this is Nori. These folks, I, I, I have enterprise software on our farm. So we run this high-tech business software uh, that's all connected to our phones. So everybody has it. Everybody sees what everybody's doing. And it's owned by, it was a startup in San Francisco. It's owned by Corteva now. So they got corporate bought out. So they're losing some of their fluidity and some of their creativity. But anyway, their senior data scientist uh, is a brilliant woman. Um, she has a PhD from Princeton, way smarter than anyone should be talking to me. And her husband is actually a five-acre grower in Seattle that sells in the farmer's market, completely organic. But yet she sells software to farmers like me. So he, she and I immediately hit it off and started chatting. And she's friends with the folks at Nori because she's a person that wants to save the world and she's doing it through helping farmers become more efficient. Which I find very um, uh, exceptional. Um, so this is what Nori's doing. It's just a minute video. It won't be translated, but I'll give you the highlights. Um, and we'll try it. Global if we get it to work. The dangerous results of so this is a group of millennials that want to solve climate change by themselves. Right? So they started their group um, Seattle. Washington is very big on carbon. Uh, they've had some public policy stuff that's been around carbon. And once they researched it, they realized that the, the most effective way to sequester carbon to fight climate change is by getting farmers to farm the way that they're farming here at this conference. The oceans can't sequester more, the forest won't sequester more, farmland that is plowed can sequester a tremendous amount if done on scale. Uh, So they don't care the scale of the farmer, they don't care who the farmer is, they want people that are farming like the folks at this conference. Whether or not they'll be able to develop it in France, I don't know. Uh, The Four for Thousand program that we've heard about is something that they're interested in partnering with because because it's blockchain, because it's cryptocurrency, they're building it out so that it is transferable across oceans, right? It transfers everywhere. There's no currencies. There's no issues there. I mean, it would obviously be the, the, the same problems we've had today of bushels to hectares and metric to standard, but I think... They're obviously smarter than me, so they can probably figure it out better than I have. Um, but it's just been, that's just their short little intro video. And like I said, they're just a startup. Uh, they're getting a lot of money from, you know, funds and different things. And I don't know if it'll amount to anything. Uh, but it's been really fun for me as a farmer to explore because it's kind of opened up my eyes, uh, opened up my mind a little bit to what the potential is and how it gives me more of a direct route to entry of the market for carbon footprinted food. Um, I really think that that is one of the answers. Now how they do it in the animal world, um, you know, at home most of our animals are raised in confinement, large scale, you know, feedlots, essentially, whether it's chickens in houses or cows in feedlots. Those guys are gonna have a lot more issues with carbon, right? That's gonna be pretty tough to, to trans. Our dairies don't go outside at all, um, typically. I mean, there's a few grass-fed dairy herds, but very, very few. Our dairies are uh, three to 5,000 cows, and the cows never go outside. Um, so that's going to be a little bit different. Um, I won't do a commentary on what those folks do, because I think that all cows should probably be starting to hit some pastures here and there, but that's the model that we've built. Um, but I think that, that, that I think consumers will... Once we build transparency into what we're doing, the consumer will be educated. I don't think that the consumer is not educated from a lack of effort. I think in a lot of ways, we as farmers, whether in France or the US, have done a very poor job of educating. 
by blocking off our farms, by hiding what we do, thinking that that is the secure route, I think that we have gone backwards, whereas if we had been transparent and let folks know how their food is being produced, I think they would be much more apt to have us there. Um, I give talks, not a lot, um, I work a lot, but I go talk to farm groups and they're very open to anything you say. You know, like here, everybody's very open-minded. You know, whether it's planting green, what Christian Abade is doing is, is crazy, right? But we're all open to it. We all want, I wanted to be there, but they didn't have a translator. Um, but we're not, we're not getting that message out, right? But we're open-minded, but we always end up talking, at least where I'm from, to one another. You know, we tell our story to other farmers. How do we get to the millennial Parisian and say this is what farmers are doing and it's not bad. In fact, it's pretty good. These are the reasons why it's good. But the story doesn't make the news, right? It's not something that's exciting. But I think that as farmers, we need to start figuring out how to open up that line of communication so that all the press isn't bad. We have bad press in France, right, for farmers? For the most part, right? I mean, probably. I mean, I know at the U.S., most of the you know, the things that are popular with the press, if there's an agricultural story, it's, you know, somebody throwing a pig or, you know, a dead cow being drugged by a forklift or... And that's not a normal farmer. You know, most farmers care for their animals, whether it's, it's a confined animal or not, but, you know, there are exceptions to every rule, but the guys that are being good don't get the rule. So I think if we can start to get into topics that relate, that aren't just seeds and fertilizers and herbicides, but carbon footprint, cryptocurrency, blockchain, start talking the language of the community that we sell to, I think then we can get some positive press. We can get people, we need to get people on our side to push us forward in order to innovate. And I don't think that we can just sit down and watch it happen. We have to be involved. Um, is kind of my take on it. I don't know what you guys think of that. Well, I think as you become my experience, and I can't speak for everyone, is that as I've become more transparent, as I've talked to more people, it has pushed me to farm differently. So I, don't, I agree with you on the confined animals that most of the public does not want to know how our animals are reared, which is a problem because they're the ones that are purchasing the products that we don't want them to know how they were produced. So as a farmer, what product do we buy where we don't, don't we want to know where everything, I want to know where my seed's grown, how it's grown, I want to know where my fertilizer comes from, I want to know what's in my herbicide package, I want quality, and I want complete transparency in the pricing structures, I'm sending out different price sheets, I want to know where my combine's made, I want to know how it's made, but yet we expect people to, the, the thing that they consume to not know, but I think that more farmers might, and I could be wrong, that as they open up and you start to talk to people, you get a lot of good ideas. Um, you know, the environmental community taught me a great deal. I mean, when I started farming green, there was not a person in agriculture in my area that supported or liked what I did. They all told me I was nuts. And they still do. I mean, it's been a long time. We had a, uh, my pioneer uh, seed salesman. It wasn't my salesman. It was his boss. It was a regional guy. Uh, he was from Iowa. Iowa's much different than where I live. It's still very conventional, you know, fall tillage, nitrogen in the fall, you know, on through. It's, it's the old school mentality. He called my salesman to meet him at one of my fields that was about this tall a cover, it, you know, slow burn down. We had mixed two chemicals together, so it would be a slower kill to get the corn up. And he talked to my salesman and said, you need to go talk to Trey and have a heart-to-heart. -heart. He's going to bankrupt his farm. This is, a, this is a mess. He's one of our key customers that we rely on. You know, I'm a loyal pioneer customer, so they tell other farmers that that's what I grow, right? It helps them, and it helps me. They give me better pricing, and I, I don't advertise, but farming's a small community. And he said, Trey... Jonathan, he's making us look bad. You got to talk to him. And he was very serious. 
I mean, he thought what I was doing was so unsound because it looked so much different. And the field did great, you know, it was an early planted cornfield. Um, so, but when I went to the environmental community, very smart people, good scientists, some didn't like what I did. And I said, let's try what I'm doing. And they said, well, what you're doing is good. Let's get other farmers, to, let's, do, let's get some researchers in, let's get some scientists in and get these folks, this Ray Weil and the Steve Murskys of the world to come in and help you learn and we'll help you pay for the research so that you can learn. So the transparency, me going into communities where I was very uncomfortable really helped me grow. Um, they really helped me learn. Um, this meeting is obviously out of my element, right? I'm in France, um, <laughs> for one, but, you know, but this is where you learn. It's how I've learned um, a lot. So it wasn't just by going to my agronomist because my agronomist said it'll never work. Um, I still have folks that say it won't work. I have a, uh, I don't know what we are on time, 5.15? Okay, so I have a uh, older gentleman, he's 95, that I rent a farm from. And this was very telling for me. I'm bringing a large group of people with me, you know, whether it's the team that works with me, the owners that I rent from, you know, my suppliers, they're all watching me go through this. Basically, somewhat alone. I mean, I have a big group around me, but there's not other farmers doing it. So I rent from a guy that was a dairy farmer, and he's 95 now. He's always been single all his life, and I mean, he's old. When you go into his house, you shake him. You know, you have to walk up and kind of go like this, and you hope that he's alive, right? You know, you hope that he wakes up. It's a victory that day, and he loves to talk. You know, we talk about fall gardens and how things used to be, and peach trees, and how to prune them, and he's got all this great knowledge of the way the world used to be. So when I first started farming his farm, we plowed it. Chisel plow, not mole board, but same difference. And then I went to no-till on it, and we do no-till two out of three years, and then we always felt like we had to reset the no-till, which now doesn't make any sense, but that's what we did 20 years ago. So I started farming at Green. And this is one of my landowners that I thought would be concerned because, you know, it's stuff this tall and there's flowers and we're out there planting. So he called me and said I had to come visit him. And I figured, you know, it was going to be the lecture, how I'm crazy and don't do it this way. And he, he uh, looked at me and he said, I've farmed this land my whole life. And he said, this is the best way it's ever been farmed. So this gentleman was 95 years old, had everything in his mind and body that would tell him that what we were doing was wrong, but when he saw the clarity of the water, the lack of dust, and the soil stability, and the crops that were being grown, it convinced him that what we were doing right, and he acknowledged that what, when we initially started doing it, he thought it was crazy. So we've had, I've had several stories like that where people that should not like the way that we farm, maintain an open mind, and then start to, to embrace it and see that it really does work well. Um, like I said, it's not perfect, but it's something that I think is, is very convincing, um, which is very inspiring to be at this meeting to see so many other folks doing it and trying it. There's a few people that are ahead of me that have been doing it for quite some time uh, that have books out and different things. There's a guy in North Dakota, a guy in Ohio, um, right now, my network is uh, very small. There's about five or six. We're not organized, but we you know, talk on the phone and challenge one another. I don't know. Um, I don't know about the movement. The one of a kindness, I would say my size differentiates me somewhat. Um, there's not many folks doing it on my scale, but I don't think that scale is relevant. Uh, it's the vision of the farm, all the folks on my team that work with me. You know, I have, uh, you know, nine families that depend on my farm for a livelihood, plus myself. So those folks all believe in the vision as well. So it's like having 10 different farmers working together. So I don't think as long as the, the, the message is being conveyed to everyone in the system, whether it's suppliers, network, collab any collaboration that we have, as long as everyone's on the same team, that's probably the only thing that makes me unique. Um, I have friends in Indiana that are doing it. I have friends in Iowa that are doing it. Um, I have a friend in South America and Argentina that's doing it. Um, so I think that, that when people come to conferences like this and kind of see the success 
and I think the farmers are happier that are doing it. Um, you know, I'm happy to, part of mine was probably a midlife crisis of some sort, even though I was 30, but just wanted to change the way we were doing things. Maybe it was, you know, part of it was probably wanting to differentiate myself from my father. You know, what is my stamp on the farm? Am I simply going to follow in my father's footsteps and do exactly what he did so everyone will always call me his son? Or am I, is he going to eventually be my father? Right? I want him to be my father, right? I want to be the A guy. I want to be the guy that put his stamp on the farm. I was given a lot. The farm was big when I got home. And I've grown it, and he's grown it with me. But how am I going to put my footprint on it? What are my personal beliefs that are going to make me different than him? So that might have been part of it too. You know, part of it's probably a little, <laughs> a little craziness. Um, but wanting that, having that as a young person, you know, the goal of, you know, when I was 25, it was probably to till uh, 15,000 hectares. And I went, eh, that's really no fun, right? It's human relations, it's employees, it's, logistics, it's landowners, it's not, it, it's not farming for me. You know, I want to be able to get my hands dirty. I want to be on the tractor. I want to be doing stuff. So the size thing and, and where I live is somewhat limited in agricultural scope. It's a small area. So getting that much growth was not, I don't think, practical. So then it became, how do, we, how do I do that? And then it was, how do I brand the farm? How do I make my farm different than my competition? I don't want to be the same as everyone else. We shouldn't be. We're farmers. We're independent. But we've gotten into a cycle where everything is, is very scientific and very linear. And we need to make it so that we each have our own unique path um, was kind of why I have gotten into it. But no, there's not a lot. Not many of my neighbors. All my neighbors say you have to be big to do it. So, um, you know, I don't think it... I think that people will. It just takes a, a, a personal belief that you want to do it. It doesn't make your life any easier, that's for sure. It makes it more difficult. Um, not significantly, but once the system gets done and the water's clean coming off your fields and you're not getting the erosion, it's much easier to sleep at night in the wintertime. <laughs>